Okay, so we are ready to start and a warm welcome to our first Ignite AI conference. So this is actually our first global event and it is 100% online. And together we are hosting this conference all the way up from Umeå, up north in Sweden, uh, through Stockholm, Gothenburg and Malmö. So this is a teamwork setting all of this up and also together with AI Innovation of Sweden, uh, Startup Sweden and Thinks. So the conference today is all about listening to a bunch of really great startups. And we also have some interesting keynote sessions, some panel discussions about how to design an AI pilot, how to invest in AI. And we will also listen to AI Innovation of Sweden. But we also have tomorrow a matchmaking with Swedish startup, AI startups, and together with corporates. And uh, not only that, we have more than 150 attendees all from all over the world, actually from Norway, Finland, Germany, Turkey, India, Japan, Brazil, Australia, and New Zealand, just to mention a few of them. So hopefully we'll have really nice discussions here online this afternoon, and there will be a great online meetings tomorrow. Uh, in the audience, uh, we have investor corporates, the AI community, and of course, startups. And we have a full packed agenda today. Hopefully you will be really stuck on your screen, but we also have two short breaks for you. So you can stretch your legs and go and get some coffee. You don't want to miss out. Last but not least, we have also an online mingle uh, where you can sign up with meetings from uh, all over the world. But let's start uh, with a welcome session from the program lead from Ignite Sweden. Uh, and I would love to say a warm applause, but please uh, welcome Stina Lanz from Ignite. Hello. Hello. Thank, Thank you very, you very much, much for that, for that very, warm very warm introduction. introduction. I don't know, Maria. I, don't know, Maria. I, I hear. I, hear. Go. Go. I don't. Um, okay. okay. I'm, I'm hearing myself. myself. Let's mute me. Maybe Maria, 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 through the interaction with this. this. Okay. Great. Maria is muted and that actually solved the, the small issue. So can I ask Michelle to switch the picture to, to my picture? Thank you very much. Please stop there. <laughs> Next one. <laughs> Thank you. That's fantastic. It's like a live DJ set or something. Uh, my name is Stina Lanz and I'm heading up Ignite since a couple of years. Uh, in Ignite, we have one, one mission and that mission is even more important now than, than it has been all of these years that we haven't been running Ignite. And that's actually to help startups find real customer cases. So what we actually do is to support the startups, to open the doors to the right customers. We provide them with sales training. We also have extensive coaching and some legal support when they are designing or signing a contract with a larger company. And, uh, but in order to do that, we need to have larger companies willing and interested in collaborating with startups. So that's kind of our dual mission to find, identify, and also teach large companies more of how they can actually work together with startups and innovate with startups. So for the large companies, we offer a lot of networking because we believe that one large company can learn a lot from another large company when, when innovating with startups. We also do uh, something that we call needs analysis 
and we also share a lot of best practices in this corporate community. Next slide, please, Michelle. All, since the start, uh, we have uh, actually been quite active. Since four years, we have done more than 2,390 meetings between large companies and small startups. And we've been working with 410 startups, Swedish in most of the cases, uh, 132 corporates, and all of this has today's date led to more than 100 commercial collaborations. So please, next slide. These are some of the corporates that we have been working with, but we have actually been working with 138 corporates. And uh, this, when we start working with a corporate, uh, we ask them a lot of questions. And I will, during this session, I will very short brief you on aggregated what all the corporates are asking for when it comes to innovating with startups. But we also do some service. So in order for a corporate to be really, really attractive to a startup, Michelle, next slide, please. Uh, these, uh, this is actually what the startups are asking about. So for a corporate to be really attractive to a startup, if you can offer strategic partnerships, if you can offer to help the startups access new markets and develop new market channels, and if you can offer the startup to actually become a customer to the startup, that's the really the top of the list uh, that you can do to be as attractive to the really best startups as possible. We asked kind of the same questions to corporates. I'm asking Michelle to switch slide again. Uh, when we asked the corporates why they are interested in interacting with startups, you could see that the answers are not quite matching. They want to explore new technologies, of course, um, but they also want access to entrepreneurial talent and energy, and also to develop an internal innovation culture. And you could say that these two worlds could collide but it's actually not. When we did this survey for the first time, these answers weren't really the ones that we were hoping for because we were hoping that the corpus would say, well, access to startups is also access to something that we never could have invented ourselves, right? But following some of the corpus actually doing these kind of projects with the startups, we very soon learned that by collaborating with startups, innovating together with startups, on real important uh, problems and challenges actually gave the larger companies uh, a more innovative culture internally. But also you could see a very, very clear result in access new talent. Uh, by collaborating with startup, they were actually uh, able to, to hire more talented people as well because all the high talent people, they really want to work in an innovative environment, so to say. So, uh, to sell something about the process. Next slide, please, Michelle. When we start to work with a corporate to find the corporate challenges in order to be able to, to help the startup find the right corporate for what they are developing, uh, we do a needs assessment. And as I told you in the beginning, by now we have been working with 138 corporates. So we've done quite many of these needs assessments. And all the way from the beginning, I would say that digitalization and AI have been really the top of, top, uh, of what all these corporates are actually uh, looking for. And that's the big challenge that they want to solve. Uh, so. Heading on to next slide, Michelle. If you aggregate all of these needs assessments, this is actually what you find. Uh, as a corporate today, you're struggling to transform your customer offering in a digital way because you want to move from product to a service. But you also need to transform the way you're working. And here, for example, smart maintenance is one of the really top challenges that many, many of the corporates are, are looking for to solve. Uh, and I would tell you about one of these cases that we've actually been uh, 
the birthplace to. Next slide, please, Michelle. This case is quite interesting. You also hear more from, from Econo further down uh, during this afternoon. Alpha Laval came to us uh, only when we just have started Ignite. And uh, we started to ask them, what are your actually main challenges? What would you like to solve? If you could, if you already could have had like uh, tons of money and tons of, of people to solve something, what would that have been? And it turned out that a huge part of Alphalabal's um, business was actually maintenance. And maintenance on quite heavy machinery, uh, in this case, heat exchangers. So uh, then we also found, found Econo, an AI startup. And then by then, there were only three people actually hired in Econo. Now there are many more. I'm sure that Jung will tell you all about this later on. But the first pilot that they set up together was actually applying Econos Edge AI on existing sensors on the actual heat exchangers to learn how this heat exchanger could operate and more importantly, learn when they were about to break or fail in any way. And it turned out that this scheduled, pre-scheduled maintenance scheme was not needed. Uh, when having this intelligence on the heat exchangers, the heat exchanger could themselves start to call for service. And even more importantly, one heat exchanger can actually learn from another when it should be operating in the same kind of environment. So the fleet of heat exchanger became really, really smart. And now the two of them together has actually rolled out this on a commercial scale, which I think is a fantastic achievement. It took only about two years actually for them to go from pilot to commercial rollout. So that's a big heads up to both Econo and Alpha Laval. So next screen. Um, something I want to send with you today uh, to, to have in mind is even if we are now facing really, really difficult times, it will be another time approaching very soon again. And if you continue to experiment now, the chances is that you will actually succeed with one or many of these experiments to go to commercial rollout uh, when this period also is over. So this is one of my absolute favorite quotes. And I think this is really true. It depends on the numbers. The more experiments you can do and the more you can cut the cost of doing experiments, for example, together with startups, uh, the more likely you will be to actually succeed with several of them. So, Maria, I'm yeah. supposed to be inviting you to, to the conversation now. I don't know if we will solve this echo problem, but next slide, please, Michelle. Yes, uh, so uh, thank you, Stina. Uh, from my point of view, I think it's really interesting to see that in Sweden, and I think in uh, all over the world, we are have been quite good at uh, as an incubator because that's my my home uh, to help startups with uh, finding capital and uh, building their teams. But now it's a lot of focus on uh, finding the right customers at the right time. Uh, do you see any any challenges uh, right now or any? Anything we can do right now in the moment to just uh, maybe speed this up even more? Well, I think uh, one thing is absolutely to, to stay on to this full conference because we'd have, we will have a lot of tips and tricks and great ideas on this topic uh, throughout the afternoon. Um, but um, very, I would say from Ignite's perspective, this, what we are actually doing now, uh, it came up as an ID or I would say a lot of startups actually asked us that they were quite devastated that all of the big fairs and all of the activities were shut down. So all of their possibilities and arenas to, to actually meet new prospects and meet new customers and discuss new ideas were closed. So uh, two years ago, 14 days only, we decided that, okay, let's try to do an online conference to see if we can in any way online uh, help the situation. So this is actually a result. And from Ignite's perspective, we have changed all our activities to online throughout uh, the spring, actually. So uh, 
that is of course one part to still be active and to still meet each other and to still start discussions. I think that's super important for all of us also to keep some kind of sanity in, in this situation that, that we are in. Um, I agree. And just to, to fill up, uh, fill in here, uh, for all of you out there, we are a very dedicated team, I would say. I mentioned that we are from up in Umeå down to south in Malmö uh, today, but we also have been having a lot of discussions how we can help as many startups as possible with finding the right uh, maybe pilot product if they could be project they could be really small but please reach out to us if you have any ideas uh, maybe in the public sector or wherever you are if you could uh, start some small project because what i think it's amazing here we have the tools uh to actually set them up and that's an important thing so we could help you to speed them up absolutely i think that's the most important uh, part of ignite's mission now to to help speed things up and to also maybe help you find found find <laughs> funding in some of the cases and uh, as maria said we have a lot of tools and we are actually a lot of people all over sweden that are eager to to help and support you in this so what about the goal with uh, today if we uh, end the, our short welcome session with that what would you love to see happening after maybe tomorrow afternoon yeah the thing is uh, today we will we are also trying really trying out a new format here uh, so what we will do is that we will listen to nine fantastic ai startups i think we have a picture on the next screen uh, with the logos, Michelle. And uh, all of these are available for one-to-one -one meetings tomorrow. So any one of you listening now uh, will be able to schedule meetings with them. Just tell us uh, that you would like to have a meeting and we will set that up. We already have about 20 large companies and investors lined up for meeting sessions tomorrow. So that's really fantastic we are really happy with with the uh, with the lineup so far but you're very welcome to ask for more meetings and also i want to address the startups here today that are not on uh, this list if this turns out great and from our perspective great is that we will have tons of meetings booked tomorrow uh, we will of course do this again so please register to ignite and we'll make sure to to have you on the next time we also have a lot of other matchmaking activities that are not uh, a conference like this. So it's really a good idea to keep you uh, keep registered and um, active in our events. And just a call to action to all the startups out there uh, to really look into your, if you haven't signed up on Ignite, you should definitely do that uh, straight away. But maybe you have tweaked your, uh, your business a bit now going more digital or have something new going on make sure that you have an updated description of your startup so you are easily found by the larger corporates exactly but now i think it's enough from us maria at this point we need to welcome our first fantastic startup on stage so uh i would like to hand over uh the microphone to Daniel at Stream Analyze. Please take it away. Daniel, I think you're on mute. I'm trying to get him. This is really interesting. It's an interesting experience for us. 
also everyone is actually in their homes uh, doing this. So uh, I hope you bear with us. Yes, and uh, then we can just continue our discussion, right, Stina, until it's yeah, there. Okay. Uh, I would love to see how we could actually follow up also. I mean, one of the goals is to, to make the pilots happen. Uh, so the best thing would be if we could see maybe already next week uh, a few uh, ongoing new meetings uh, and maybe pilots uh, that could start really soon because I know there is a bit of crisis for a lot of startups to survive. What is the, the fastest uh, one from uh, meeting uh, the matchmaking event to actually signing an agreement? Uh, a startup with a corporate? Actually, yes, we, we have some, but I think the most impressive one uh, recently was actually uh, an energy company up north in Sweden called Jämtkraft. Uh, they met with a, with a startup with a solution for, the, for how to present your initiative for, for the environment and global goals online, uh, both for the community members to to learn about what the, this uh, electric what this Jämtkraft actually doing within the areas but but also for you know to get a higher engagement for all from all employees and they actually they met in uh, in june and uh, just one month later they had passed the pilot phase and rolled out and that's quite impressive, especially since this kind of company, uh, like Yamcap, they're, they're, it's not a big company and they don't really have any processes for, for working with startups uh, on a larger scale. So that's super impressive. But then on the other hand, uh, we have, for example, ABB uh, Synolith that has been uh, part of Ignite since, since the start. They are now rolling out about three pilots, paid pilots with ABB a month which I think is also a fantastic result, then you really have made startup collaboration a culture and a way of working, and not only something that you, you do with, with separate tasks to try something new. That's like really in their, their culture now. What would you say with uh, Jämtkraft was the, the kind of the keys to have that kind of speed? Was it anything? Sorry, I'm, I'm getting, you know, I have a back channel here with, with, the, with the team. They, they say that we are switching to Agilon now instead. Okay. So let's continue our discussion later on. Absolutely. Peter. All right, yes, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Welcome, Peter. I hear you perfectly well. Awesome, great. Off to a good start then. Uh, so let's get right into it. And next slide, please, Michelle. Uh, so some background first, um, Agile is a process intelligence platform. So we basically read timestamps and event logs from business IT systems. And then we use them to do three main things. Uh, first of all, visualize the process flow so that users can discover their actual assets processes and understand any deviations or bottlenecks. Uh, then analyze them to find the root causes behind these deviations and understand that the impact that these deviations have on uh, the company metrics. Uh, and then finally to monitor these process flows to understand if there are any new deviations popping up uh, or to validate that any change initiatives have the sort of impact that uh, you intended on the processes. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so our case was done together with uh, Eldon, which is a Swedish uh, manufacturing company that make uh, enclosures for uh, electronics and other technical equipment. Uh, so the base product is quite simple, but a large share of the revenue is actually from uh, customized orders or uh, one-off products. Uh, so customers can use a web-based uh, configuration tool, quite similar to what uh, car companies usually have, uh, to customize their orders, and then Eldon will follow up with a quotation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but the challenge that Eldon actually had was, uh, it's kind of a luxurious problem. They actually had too high volume of incoming requests from this configurator, so they couldn't actually process them all. And at the same time, this uh, quotation process can be quite time consuming and involve a lot of different steps. There are blueprints and drawings and cost quite calculations and stuff like that. So they have a, a custom made workflow management system just to handle this uh, quotation process. Uh, but at the same time, the margins on these orders can be quite low because uh, the end product usually or uh, often costs just 10 or 20,000 Swedish crowns. 
So there's not a lot of uh, margin to spend a lot of time in the quotation process then. Uh, so what they needed was a way to prioritize their sales efforts and uh, basically get a, a way to score these requests based on how likely they were to turn into a real order. Uh, next, please. So our first iteration in trying to solve this didn't really have anything to do with Agilon. It was more of a traditional AI setup, if there's any such thing as a traditional AI. Uh, but basically, we ingested nine different attributes from this product configurator. We blended that with some data from their ERP system and uh, then implemented that as a random forest uh, algorithm in R. And the results were pretty good. The precision went from our 56% uh, benchmark accuracy to 68%. Uh, so quite good start, but that was also only the start. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so in the second iteration, we involved Agilon as well and blended our process intelligence data sets with these AI capabilities. Uh, and the idea here is that process execution should, of course, uh, impact outcomes. So depending on what we do in the actual uh, quotation management process, that should impact whatever the uh, outcome will be of whether that turns into an order or not. Uh, and it sure did. When we combined these two, the precision actually went up to 71% at the start of the workflow, so at the very first event, all the way up to 91% accuracy at the last sort of stages in the process where Ildon could reasonably still cancel out and save some time. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the reason that this works so well is basically the data preparation that we had to do as part of the standard Agilon product. Uh, so when we ingest this sort of uh, event log data from business systems, we have to clean it, we have to standardize it uh, into a very uh, simple and uh, standardized structure. And usually this type of data is also very new in AI applications because usually this is low level data that is not loaded to data lakes or data warehouses. So it has a lot of lift when added to uh, the possibilities of an AI model. Uh, next, please. Also, as part of our analytical capability in Agilon, we do a lot of feature modeling behind the scenes. So we basically unfold this structure and create usually there are thousands of uh, features related to how this process was actually executed. If uh, certain events are occurred, if they occur in a, a certain sequence and so on. And so it's a very good sort of playground to build AI on top of. And usually this is like 80% of the time spent in a data science project, but now building on top of an existing application like this, you basically have this type of data set from day one. Uh, and so next and final slide, please. So in terms of next steps, we're currently working on implementing this type of prediction functionality into the base or core Agilon product. And I'm super excited to try that out on additional use cases. It doesn't just have to be quotations. Um, so we want to validate and pilot that with, uh, on, on other scenarios. So if you're at all interested in uh, understanding the potential outcomes of your business processes, let's talk tomorrow or uh, whenever suitable. That's it for me. Thanks. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, that was a great presentation. Um, so what I have a question for you. Uh, what would your next dream customer be? Um, that would be five or 10 of them, actually. <laughs> so uh, yep. what we want to do in the pilot phase is basically try this out in quite different scenarios. So that's also different sizes of companies in different industries. So uh, any company that is reasonably transaction intensive, I would say, but that could be manufacturing, retail, logistics, uh, quite wide spectrum of companies. But uh, so I have a comment as well uh, to you, Peter. Uh, now we have the chance to maybe have a call to action to anyone in the audience uh, online, if they know anyone. So if you could be more specific, uh, who do you want to get in contact with tomorrow? In terms of just one company or? Maybe more. Try um, to be as yes, you can. Yeah, uh, automotive would be nice. So uh, in, in that case, I would say Volvo, so, since I noticed they were on the list as well. So Good. So then you all know what to try to do to uh, maybe help Peter to get in contact with them. Perfect. Now we want to hand over the, the word to June. CEO of, of Econo. Hello, can you hear me? 
perfectly clear. Great. Excellent. So I guess my four minutes start now. So good afternoon. My name is John Linden. I'm CEO and co-founder of Econo Solutions, a software company that develops edge machine learning. Uh, that means true machine learning that runs on board connected devices to develop features that are self-learning, predictive and smart. Next slide, please. As you know, everything gets connected. Uh, predictions talk about 50 billion connected devices in just the next two years. Technically, IoT means that we connect things with sensors that generate data. Business-wise, this means that we extend the relationship with our products to after they leave the factory. This means that we cannot have 50 billion dumb devices. This means that it requires automation, and it means that we have to make them smart. And this is where machine learning comes in handy. Next slide, please. The cloud is good for a lot of things, like finding common denominators between millions of connected vehicles, but it also comes with some big limitations, especially for automation and individual learning. Adding edge machine learning enables the true potential of IoT. There, we can actually process real-time, high-frequency streaming sensor data with no latency on critical decisions and with minimal dependency on connectivity. And on top of that, we also solve the integrity question since the data processing is done on the device with no human intervention. Most importantly, which is due to our incremental learning capabilities, we can actually learn individually per device. Next slide, please. Let me give you some examples. The first one is Husqvarna auto mowers. I have one of those. I wanted to learn my garden, not a garden, but my garden. I wanted to learn when and where to mow during different times of the year, how it avoids getting stuck in different places, and how we can actually reduce the energy consumption by 30%. The best part though, for, especially for Husqvarna, is that I become a loyal customer. When it's been running around my garden for 6,400 hours and I'm in the process of buying an upgrade, I become a loyal customer as I can move these learnings with me to the upgrade. Or the AC, the air conditioners. We have for decades been perfecting the production of air conditioners to make them extremely energy efficient. But that doesn't matter if we put it in a room with an open door to a tropical climate. This is, in my opinion, the next big sustainability gain. gain when we can actually auto-tune all individual devices to run at optimum independent if it's sold to Stockholm or Seville. Or the electrical car. I want the remaining range to actually indicate how far I can go, depending on where I live, the climate I live in, the road and the driving conditions in which I operate. And a car in our world actually represents hundreds of opportunities as all different things from brakes to climate control, emission control, echo driving and steering becomes smart and self-learning. Next slide, please. So why Econo? Well, because we're for real. We've done this before. We touched the ground running three years ago based on seven years of research at the University of Borås. We've already provided technology to companies like ABB, Volvo, Sandvik, Siemens, Alfa Laval, and Husqvarna to make their products smart. Four minutes is not enough to go through everything. I would love to tell you more about different use cases and applications where this makes sense. I would like to tell you more about our unique features like the incremental, incremental learning that enables us to learn per device. And also how we can apply change detectors to figure out when something deviates from what's expected. I'd like to tell you more about the competitive advantages, like how we have the smallest footprint and the best performance. But I guess that will have to wait for tomorrow's one-on-one -on -one meetings. So thank you. Thank you so much, Yoon. So any questions, Maria? Or was it crystal clear? Oh, I have a question. I might Hello? It was cutting I, up I a have bit. a question for you, actually, that came from the public. Please. Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Uh, can, I, can I make the question that came from the public? Please. How will the 5G effect on the end? on the edge solution? How will it be that effect? Well, that's a good question. Um, the fact is, I personally have a background from the telecom space. So I've been going through the 2.5G, the 3G and the 4G transitions in the past. 
Um, every time we, we expect that this is gonna, gonna turn the world upside down and we're never gonna need more bandwidth. That's not the case. I think that the 5G will drive the, the revolution with IoT, that more companies uh, are willing to do more things. So I think that's very favorable for us. I, I think that we still will have a number of use cases where it, for example, due to, to what I mentioned before, the, um, the integrity question that you don't want to send all the sensitive, uh, sensitive uh, sensor data, raw sensor data to the cloud for processing because that includes manual intervention uh, and communication that you actually want to do some things at the edge. So I see a lot of synergies. I hope that 5G will just be an accelerator for, for the IoT and that, that, that people will actually, companies will do more. Um, and that's what I expect. Thank you so much. Uh, so let's move on on our busy agenda uh, to uh, Daniel from Stream Analyze. Are you ready for your presentation? Yes, definitely. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Daniel Spar. I'm COO for Stream Analyze. Really sorry for the interruption there. My whole internet connection died. Uh, and so we're a software platform provider. Uh, we do analytics on the edge in real time interactively. But we'll get into that. Please next. Imagine that you could change all your products fundamentally overnight. Imagine that you could determine in advance when any of your products is about to break down. Imagine that you could add new services to your existing products on the fly. Now we can do all of this. Through our edge analytics platform, it can bring, may, allowing you to, to create, deploy and run any AI model from a simple statistical mathematical model to a machine learning model or deep learning model. If you have one already, we can run that. And you can allow you to install it and run it on any of your existing or future hardware that you have out there. And it requires no need for any deep programming skills, but it's made for the analysts and engineers in your organization because it allows you then to leverage your specific domain knowledge because the things that you're running out there are things that you have inherent uh, people who actually know how to run. And it also allows you to actually run and deploy these things interactively. So you can send queries down to the machines, but also deploy new models on the fly overnight. Next slide, please. So I think we're just going to exemplify this through one use case that we've been working with, uh, which is with Who's Corner. They have uh, handheld chainsaws that they, you know, they run all over the place, and they want to be able to determine in advance when the actual chain on the on the chainsaw needed to be lubricated, and eventually being able to automate this whole process. Today, um, people who are working with this have to bring two of them out into the forest because they're walking far in, and when they break. They don't want to have to walk back because they're losing time. But if they know when they need to lubricate this, that will avoid the downtime in there. Now, we worked with, with one of their absolute experts, in, and this is one of these a true cases where you show where the domain knowledge becomes so important. He knew everything about chainsaws, vibrations, rotation speeds, how it, you know, how it actually behaves when it does different things. But what he'd been doing is working for six or seven years to try to automate an AI on the actual chainsaw to get this up and running. We did a project together with them and in six weeks, we had this fixed. So what did we really do? Well, we, we installed our software platform onto their chainsaw. Now through that, that allowed their engineer now to actually extract data interactively. And he had been doing this before by connecting chainsaws through cables to laptops, doing recordings, having to sit in the lab, going through and doing a model in MATLAB, hand this over to an IT engineer who's gonna try and program this deploy it on the machine, retest. Now he could do this himself. So rather than having to have somebody who is a programmer to develop the actual AI model, he did it on his own. So the data extraction where you spend most of the time went about 20 times faster according to him. And then he could deploy the model quickly on his own determining how is this actually acting. And what he could do then is he could get early distant warnings on when his chain was getting too overheated but it could also determine when it's about to break down. So this was creating a lot of business benefit for them and speeding up their whole product development process. And this is just one example of how you could actually use our platform on your devices 
to do analytics out there on the edge. Next slide, please. So my only question to you is why not? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel. Uh, so if we could uh, address the same question to you, I mean, I heard the speed six weeks uh, and 20 times faster with the data extraction. That sounds amazing. So what's your next dream customer? Who do you want to hook up with tomorrow after this conference? And this well, is a look at specifically, you know, we, we've seen some of the customers we think, you know, AT&T, big exciting, Orange, Genius are a few that we think are exciting. Uh, anywhere where you have uh, scale, but in particular, where you want to be able to change your models over time interactively, but also want to be able to drill down onto your machines, to understand what's happening, because the interactiveness is one of our absolute strengths and powers using our platform. And we little jokingly say it's like installing Excel. If you're a CFO, you don't get a you know complete uh, P&L model up and running from day one. You know how to do it, but it provides you the tools to actually build that yourself and work with it interactively. Perfect. Thank you so much, Daniel. A big applause to all of you startups. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, so for all of you attendees in the audience, uh, please, if you have any questions, write it down on the Q&A and we will uh, ask the startups these questions. So heading on to a new interesting topic, uh, the state of AI patents in Europe. Is it really that difficult? And uh, what are we on the global scale? Let's welcome uh, to this stage, uh, Dimitris. Uh, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Fantastic. So. Uh... First of all, thank you for inviting me to this very interesting event. I was so happy when Stina reached out to me and she asked me whether we could sort of say, talk about the artificial intelligence, uh, because honestly speaking, I, I think we have some more work to do. I will hopefully tell you why I'm a little bit concerned about the development, but uh, let's sort of say, jump into the topic and hopefully feel free to ask questions of whatever will pop up. So. Uh, my name is uh, Dimitris Giannocaro. I'm the CEO and co-founder of IMIP. And if we jump into the next slide, uh, on today's uh, presentation, uh, I will uh, shortly talk about IMIP and then directly jump into today's topic. Could we maybe go into the next slide if possible? Thank you. And uh, then of course, the idea will be to present to you a very big study that was sort of say executed. And I think that all of us should be aware of and hopefully we could act based on what we see. So if we go into the next slide, uh, IMIP is a multi-billion dollar venture backed software company in the space of IP. And this is not about internet protocol, it's actually intellectual property. Uh, the company was founded uh, by IP experts that wanted to bridge the gap between IP and R&D. IMIP today is located in three countries and are today supporting companies such as SKF, Research Lab, Swish, Atlas Copco, Autoleap, et cetera, et cetera. There are many technology companies that we are currently supporting to revolutionize, so to say, the intellectual property space. If we go to slide number four, uh, the basic, so to say, of today's discussion will be so to say, a big report that was conducted by the Bordel Intellectual Property Organization, where they did, so to say, an in-depth study of how is the development in the artificial intelligence space. And this is just a small fragment. And the ones that wants to have, so to say, a peek in it, just reach out to me and I can send it to you. So uh, looking into this slide, uh, since the millennium, the number of patents have grown two times. And based on the latest trends, there is no indication that the number of patents will go down. Just see last year where the growth was over 6%. And even during crises such as SARS or maybe the financial crisis, they almost had no or very little impact on the number of filings. And most probably one of the reasons is that patents can last for 20 years. And it's one of the most strong instruments to keep you, your competitors away but also to gain freedom to operate. If you go into the next slide, here I want somehow to show you a quick snapshot where you can see patents application versus scientific publications. 
my earliest publication here. And this is now a snapshot of artificial, so to say, intelligent relating pattern families. And you can see that the heavy grew by an average of 28% and the scientific publications by five to 6% annually between 2012 and 2017. If you continue on the next slide, uh, I'm showing you, so to say, the ratio between scientific publication and patent families by earliest publication year. And why do you think that is important? Well, here's the thing. The ratio between scientific publications to patent families, so to say, can show us when are we moving into application development phase. And we can see that the ratio has dropped eight to one in 2010, and in 2016, three to one. And that is a very strong indicator that, you know, we are now moving into something where the industry would like most probably to protect their own applications. If we're then moving into the next slide, I want here to show you a little bit, so to say, of all the patents that were gathered. And I can tell you there were over 150,000 patents and plus. You can see a little bit, so to say, on the, on the different sort of axis, where on the one hand, we look into the different so technologies that you can look into and pursue for in the AI space. And on the other axis, we can see the type of applications that are use, used in. And uh, the, the strong color of green will show you the intensity. So of course, the, the more green it becomes, the more intensities. So we can really see, so to say, where the whole industry is moving toward. And bear in mind, when patents are filed, the industry is also in that space. Moving then further down to slide number nine, here, I want to show you the top applicants, which consist of universities and public organizations in selected locations. And here, I somehow try to represent them in number of patent families. And what you can really see, which is really on the top, is that China and Korea are really doing huge progress there, particularly the universities and all the, so to say, public uh, organizations out there. And if you see where Europe is, we are really behind in terms of patent applications. Again, I don't say that maybe we don't have the knowledge, but somehow these countries are protecting their artificial intelligence research. And I think that is a very, so to say, strong indicator that we need somehow to think and hopefully maybe act. Because if you can really see, so to say, in the Chinese segment, we can see, so to say, from an academic perspective that they are really on the top, the universities. And what makes me also concerned is that they are also pinpointing these patterns into Europe. I will sh uh, short, shortly show to you what I mean with that. But also, if you see, so to say, among the <coughs> related scientific, so to say, publications are also among the top. So somehow, there seems to be a very strong correlation, so to say, between patterns and scientific publications. If we then look, so to say, into slide number 10, here I want to show you uh, the top applicants around the world that are filing patents. And now we talk about thousands of patents, obviously. And of course, we're not surprised to see IBM and Microsoft to be there. And also, of course, Google, but you can also see other type of companies. And again, I think this picture somehow shows us that the European companies are not really on the top there. So the question maybe we should ask us, why is that? Are we not developing artificial intelligence? Or is it because we don't think that you can protect artificial intelligence? Um, likewise, I would like to also emphasize on the public research applications from the university. And again, even there, we can see, so to say, many famous names from Asia filing patent applications. And therefore, I would like so somehow to, so to say, tell you that we need to be careful if this development will continue. Um, let's just put one example so you understand the problem right now. I did a further research into see the oppositions uh, in the AI artificial intelligence space. And we can see that Siemens, Daimler, G. Sekedevri, and all these big guys are somehow trying to file, so to say, oppositions against the Asian competitors. And their competitors are Samsung, LG Corporation, and Hyundai. And why they are doing it? Because they are feeling like you are somehow trying to reduce our market. And some of them don't want to have these patents. So my, so to say, giveaway to all of you here in this room is that please make sure on the one hand that you have freedom to operate because there are patents filed in the space. And don't assume that you're working in the software space and therefore we don't need patents. 
And secondly, if you have something so unique, go and protect it because that could be so crucial, particularly if you're a startup that wants to raise money, maybe you want to become acquired. Therefore, please look into how things develop and try to be one step ahead of competition. So with that said, I think a really long time, I would also like to say thank you. So any questions? Thank you so much. So do we have any question on the Q&A? Please uh, add in some questions if you have any. So do you see any, so the two, two suggestions from you is to really make sure freedom to operate and protect your IT. What, how can startups, uh, can you give them any advice, especially to startups? Yep, uh, my suggestion to startups, if they have, so to say, a, a dream or maybe a vision to become acquired by one of the larger corporations later on, treat your IT very professionally. And with that, I'm trying to say, look into, so to say, public sources that are for free, that's also okay. But try at least to know that you have done some type of research, you know, so you can have a look at it. Of course, reach out to IMIP. We also have some solutions there, but you know, for me, it's important that they make it right. Because I know if they will become acquired, the first thing the companies will look into, if you acquire this startup, do they have freedom to operate? And if you can't show that, they will never acquire you. It's very simple. So use the free sources definitely as a first starting point. Be aware of its limitations because they're not complete from a data source package. And secondly, try, so to say, to discuss it with your investors or with the management team, how to protect it. But please don't protect everything. Be strategic in what you would like to protect, so to say. Mm -hmm. We have a question here. Are there any governmental initiatives by EU for IP? And if so, what are they? Uh, yes, there are. There have been for many, many years, particularly if you're a Swedish company, there are many initiatives where you can actually get some support, uh, actually money-wise, from Almi. That would be my recommendation. And I believe every European country has almost a similar type of support, so you can do that. But um, I, I, I think what is important to understand is that at least before you start your company and start to offer these type of solutions, make sure that you have freedom to operate. I mean, to do, I mean, most of the people at the startups are scientists that know how to do searches in databases. Start there, see what exists, there. don't assume that it's open source and you can do it because if you haven't protected it, I can promise you, other will block you. I have seen it so many times. Yes, thank you so much. And I know there is a lot of support for the startups early on uh, from the incubators, from Almi, from, um, other support organizations. Uh, so with that, thank you so much, Dimitris. Uh, I will give you a big hand <laughs> for your talk. Thank you so much. Uh, so let's move on uh, to a short break to stretch our legs, maybe fill up some coffee. And uh, we will, uh, due to some technical issues in the beginning, we are almost on time, but we will only have a five minute of break. And I hope that's enough for you all. And uh, let's uh, see each other soon. And during the break, feel free to raise your hand, put something on Q&A and uh, chat. Uh, so see you soon in five minutes.
Okay, uh, welcome back. Uh, let's see, now I want to welcome three panelists on stage. It's Sean Lilja, CEO of Mavenoid. Do I have you with me? Not yet. Jon? Yes. Yeah, Sean? Hello. Great, super, thank you. And uh, how about Jon? Are you still online? I'm here. Ah, fantastic. And uh, Martin Rugfeldt from Sentien? Hello. Oh, great. This is, uh, this is actually fantastic. I'm really impressed that this is even possible, I must admit. So, super happy to have you. You are all three super experienced founders and uh, I've known you a couple of years now and I also know that you're really successful in uh, collaborating with large companies. You've managed uh, to, to start really interesting collaborations and also reached commercial rollout with quite a few of them. So, I was thinking that we should have a session about how you actually start. And uh, I know that uh, we've also been discussing this quite a lot. It's uh, some, or unfortunately quite many of the large companies are still struggling uh, with how they should do the first uh, collaborations uh, in order to actually build results to be able to scale the results together with you as startups. Many of the pilot projects that we see, they actually stop after the pilot itself is over because they might not have a plan on how to scale it. And I know that you have a lot of ideas on this topic. So I have three questions for you during this panel. And please, we will also ask the audience if you want to ask your questions, use the Q&A button. And we hope that we, during these 20 minutes, can make room for, for some of your questions as well. So my first question is actually, we must assume that the overall purpose of starting a pilot is to test something that you can then uh, deploy and scale out together with the corporate, right? What are your best recommendations in designing the pilot to achieve the results that you can actually build something scalable upon? And I would like to start to ask Sean. Um, so I guess we, we do two things. Um, one of them is uh, we create something called a project charter. And a project charter really is kind of our attempt to overinvest in the design of the, of the pilot. And it basically has, it's a one pager. Uh, it's like takes 60 seconds to read. And it's basically, you know, what's the purpose of this project? Uh, what are the goals? What are the stakeholders? You know, what do what will uh, different people do? It just contains that basic information that then becomes a live document that we refer to as, as the pilot goes on. Uh, and we are kind of religious about always doing these. Uh, we incorporate them uh, even into our sales process uh, to, to see that th that's kind of where we start to, to create it. Um, and uh, we all always try to make the, the customer uh, be part of, of designing it. So we don't just like do it ourselves and then say, this is the project charter, but uh, it's very important to have multiple stakeholders on the customer side uh, feel that they have created this artifact. Um, so I think that's something we do maybe, it, it sounds like a very simple thing, but we do it, uh, I would say quite in a disciplined way, which we take it very seriously. Uh, and the other thing we do is that we um, are quite uh, anal about uh, not starting a pilot before we have involved uh, exactly the rules that we need to involve for a particular company or our particular uh, product. Uh, exactly what those rules are not, is not very interested, interesting for, for the purpose of your question, but uh, unless like all those boxes are checked, we, we don't start. You're on, you're on mute, Stina. Martin, yeah. Uh, good, good catch there. Um, would you say what, could you mention one or, or two specifics uh, in this chart that you have found being more uh, important? 
Uh, do you mean like items or? Yeah, or tasks or commitments or yeah. key so, finding. So for, sure. Um, so for us, it's uh, purpose, goal, deliverables, timeline, stakeholders. Mm. That's it. Uh, and then we just map that out. And it's very important that it's not more than one page. Like we don't do uh, a long action list. It's not a project plan, it's a project charter. Um, and uh, we use it uh, actually both internally as well as with the customer. So like internally, it's often like, you know, hey, you, you know, what are the KPIs for this pilot really? Like, and then that kind of makes meetings and, and arguments much shorter. You can just refer to the, to the project charter. And is it any of these uh, that are more difficult to get uh, commitment from the larger companies on? Um, so we, uh, it would be if we just like handed the project charter as like, you know, writ you know, written by us and just like, here's, here's how we do our, our pilots. Uh, but we, we first do a free workshop with the customer and uh, pro the product charter is a uh, uh, outcome from that workshop. Uh, and so version one of the project charter actually comes from a workshop before we even sign a contract. Uh, and then we just say, look, this is how we do it at Mavenoid. This is how, you know, uh, the, the purpose of this is just to clarify what we really mean before proceeding. And there's other outcomes as well from the, from the workshop, but version 0 0.1 you know, of the project charter is, is one of them. Uh, and then once we actually finalize the project charter, then, you know, Jack and John and Lisa and Anna, they've all been involved from the customer side in producing it so it's really like they have created it as much as we have we just provided the kind of the scaffolding uh so that's kind of the the frame frame of mind in which we that, that we use when we're when we're creating these things thank you that's uh sounds like a very sound and, and a good way also to get the commitment and involvement so i would like to ask martin uh, how do you how how does your process look like uh, or your best practice process, I would say. Well, uh, it, it is uh, not too dissimilar from uh, Sean, what he has said. Uh, we do put a lot of effort in, in addition to that uh, when it comes to the KPIs into how to measure them to and make sure that we really make, uh, understand each other and, and make sure that it's, it is measurable, uh, the results that, that we are targeting. Another one that I think is, is crucial is domain expertise, um, securing that very early in the project because there's uh, often a lot of knowledge that is within uh, their local environment, the customer's local environment, that is crucial for the success of the project. And uh, in cases where the domain expert has not been allocated sufficiently to the projects, they often um, fail, um, well, there's always a risk that they will fail unless you can make them uh, actually get into the project. So, so I think that's a learning to, to be shared that make sure that domain expertise is available for the projects. Mm -hmm. uh, then data is always crucial. So we, we make an effort to early on in the discussions with the customer, get our hands on at least data samples. Uh, so that's, that's um, um, to, to validate that there is uh, sufficient um, uh, data for what they are talking about and what they are aiming for. Uh, then obviously realizing that these projects are often um, exploratory to some uh, part uh, that the customer may not exactly know what they are, uh, what they want. Uh, and that's all fine. This is very often breaking new ground. Um, and, and incorporating that in workshops so that that can be established and making sure that you, you get onto the same page reasonably early in, in the project, or well, very early in the project. Uh, and I think these, these are some of the core things that I, I think are important uh, even before you really get into starting. So we, we, we make sure that we have sufficiently uh, workshops uh, to establish this, and then we, we put this on paper. Uh, before we can get started. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, I would like to invite Jon also to to share your best practices. When what's the more most important uh, factors that you see that to make a pilot a success? 
Well, I think first and foremost, we, we need to work on a real problem. There, there's a tendency to get a bit overexcited about new technology like AI, and it kind of becomes AI for the sake of AI. Um, at the end of the day, it's just another tool uh, that's going to help them with solving real problems. Without a real problem, it's going to be very hard to prove if you really get things done. So just like Sean and, and, and Martin, we also have a process. We use something called Crisp DM that starts with business understanding, where you put the spotlight on what is the problem that we're trying to solve? How do we solve it today? Um, what are kind of the key success metrics and so forth? So everyone's aligned on, on really trying to address a real problem because too often companies start from the perspective of data that here's a bunch of data. What can we find in the data? And that's not going to take you anywhere. Uh, so you need to tee up for success. You need to drive it forward. And if you get focused on a real project where the POC is not an end in itself, but, but you actually focus on the rollout, that's where it gets interesting. Um, then you also get the right people involved because then, then you're going to have the stakeholders who care about, the new functionality that's going to go into my product or whatever it might be that impacts their, their daily business. So I think that's extremely important that you keep the right focus on problems and on the rollout rather than, than just doing uh, tire kicking. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And that brings me to my actually next question. Um, how when in this process are you also starting to discuss the business case? I mean, the problem of pro problem you actually can solve is, of course, a crucial part of that. Uh, but when, when do you start to discuss about the revenue models, uh, uh, licensing models, and, and so on? Is it at all important in the start of a pilot? Um, if I may, uh, yes. Uh, I mean, it all always kicks up. Uh, that, that's something that comes into discussion quite early, and then it's usually quite often lost after a little while. Um, and uh, uh, I think it is uh, important um, uh, to, to discuss it because it should be part of the KPIs really, uh, or at least the goal setting. Because if we're talking about getting out of the POC swamp where a lot of AI projects get stuck, uh, business case is crucial. So you have to take, take yourself to the next level by making sure there is a goal that is financial too. And, and that the people that are relevant for that business case are engaged with this project. Um, so I see it as, as a key success factor to have included that in the goals. You, do you have any take on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the customers, business model is, is definitely something that you have to take head on back to what I said before of, of addressing a real problem uh, because otherwise it's just going to be tire kicking. And um, we even go as far as saying that we should talk about who's going to sell this uh, because there's a world of a difference in how you specify if something works, if you, how you specify um, something as a success uh, unless you really know what's going to be used for. And there's a big difference if this is going to be sold as an add-on to an existing product, um, to, to, to brownfield deployments, or if it's just going to go with new deployments uh, in greenfield, if this is going to be sold as a service, if it's going to be sold as the package uh, product. I mean, all these different things impact how you actually deliver the, the solution. And, and, and unless you know where it's going to go and where you're going to take it, it's pretty useless to, to define if it's a successful POC or not. And the whole purpose of a POC is to get validation that, yes, this works. Now we can proceed into doing the real thing. Uh, and then you have to know what the real thing is. That's a uh, great conclusion. I think uh, something uh, talking about data and business models, I think there's something quite interesting in, in both of, of those aspects when, when starting a pilot specifically connected to AI. Um, I know that Martin, you and I have been talking about this earlier, but I mean, the data, you said that it's important to, to get uh, some data uh, sets. Uh, my impression is that often the data sets that a corporate uh, allows a startup to, to test with might not be the most important data sets. Uh, what, what are your advices on that? What type of data do you have to invest as a corporate uh, to actually I succeed? I think that that uh, touches on on two questions. One is the one you've said, but the other one is, is startups, uh, startups and trust. 
Um, uh, some uh, big companies are not used to working with uh, startups and may not trust them fully and, and thinking that this is sort of a special breed of, of companies, which to a certain extent it is. However, they are also uh, very, very filled up by the opportunity of working with large com companies and are taking that extremely seriously. So uh, trust shouldn't really be an issue, but it sometimes is, in which case they may not uh, share this kind of data that is relevant uh, at, at the first stage. Um, and, and that's a mistake, obviously, because the whole point of sharing data is to validate that there is patterns in the data and it's readable and, and uh, the quality and so on. Mm -hmm. So it is important to share that kind of data. Um, and it's also important to share more information about it. We've had uh, cases where we, uh, we received data samples and they said, we have a lot more data. Uh, in fact, we have huge amounts of data in addition to this. And when we actually got that data later on, it just turned out to be another sort of copy of what they already had given us, that there was no more variation in the data, which then turned the whole project upside down in terms of volumes. Um, and these kind of questions are important for, for uh, your, well, the startup partner to know. So um, uh, that in itself then needs to be connected to, to the goals that you're achieving that if, if you don't have given, if you haven't given the data that is necessary to solve the problems, well, you're gonna not reach these yeah. goals in the end. And uh, we actually have, uh, I'm always happy to talk with you and I could probably sit on for hours, but we have some questions from the audience. So Maria, I would like to ask you to address them. Yes, can we really briefly just, uh, any tips for moving from a pilot to a rollout? Sorry, well, can you, can you any repeat tips, that? Any tips from moving from the pilot, we discussed a pilot to, to really roll it out. I know that we have some great examples of rolling out globally that Stina mentioned earlier. Mm. So if I can give a quick comment to that. Back to what I said before, I think that a POC or a pilot should be an integral part uh, as, as, as a part of a project. It shouldn't be a standalone thing where you come to a stop and then you, you, you look for another go. It should be a validation on the way to solving a real problem. So that shouldn't be uh, really a question. The question should be around what does it take to actually roll this out as a feature in, these mach in this machine, in this vehicle, whatever it might be. And on the way, you're gonna have to do a POC or a pilot to validate that, yes, this works. And, and, and yes, the technology is up to spec and expectations. And, and, and the, uh, the, the thing should be that at that point, at that gate, you either exit uh, or you just proceed. So it shouldn't really be a question on, on how. That should be the, the project plan that you should go towards uh, a rollout where the, the pilot or a POC is just one step on the way. So just to clear things up, it's all about discussing that all the way in the, the starting of the pilot. Yes, that the focus should be on the, the end product and the problem you're trying to solve rather than, than the POC or pilot being a, uh, a, an end in itself. Yes. And if we add to that, um, uh, that means that you have to have a, a good process for testing and, and uh, learning from that first pilot and also having secured projects for then maybe fixing those uh, issues that may have arisen so that you can scale it. Uh, but you also have to add then uh, the training and all of those other components. And yes, before, because you're working with a startup uh, doesn't mean that you can go and, and think that everything should be extremely cheap. It's gonna cost, yes, as it does when you're rolling it, things out with bigger companies. You have to have the training, you have to have the um, uh, processes put in place and, and you have to have the support that is necessary for these. And that can maybe sometimes be forgotten that one thinks that uh, these will solve themselves. Yeah, and, and continuing on that, Martin, it's uh, one other question is about the, the thing being cheap or actually uh, startups uh, maybe wanting to uh, validate the new business model and are doing pilots for free, like paid or unpaid pilots. Any comments on that? If uh, uh, What about the pricing uh, of uh, really having that common mindset? Well, the first thing is to remember that AI technology has compared to, to uh, 
building something that can do the same thing with traditional technology, it is generally speaking a cheaper way of doing things. So it has a cost benefit compared to, to older generations of technology. When it comes to startups giving away things for free, well, I think they're shooting themselves in the foot. Uh, now, um, they don't prove the value to the organization they're selling it to, uh, and, and that's just a mistake. They should, they should charge for it. Then you, have, then you have a business model that where you have to sometimes uh, uh, be smart to, but in general, uh, generally speaking, you, sh you should charge for, for your project. Um, and so I guess the, these are the two real comments to that. Um, yeah. Mm. Okay. Can I just throw in one sentence uh, very quickly? Because I think that, that I fully respect when you, when you actually give something away for free or if you discount something because you need validation of technology. Um, I've done that in, in previous companies where you actually need to, to get into a live environment to validate the, uh, the product and the technology but not when it comes to validating the business model. That's, that's kind of the, that's extremely contradictory that, that you cannot validate the business model by giving things away for free. Um, so, so I think that it kind of makes sense that, that you always charge for something that is adding value to the customer. Good point. Good point. Thank you so much. Stina, anything more to add or are you about to close your panel discussion? I think we need to close the panel discussion and uh, I just wanted to have chance. I know that you already from the beginning was very, very good at uh, at least get something paid from your customers, right? Yeah, I guess the, the one thing I would add to the former two gentlemen's explanations, which I thought were really good, um, is that we, we use as a forcing function to um, define what happens after the pilot in the contracts. So our customers always had the opportunity to uh, bail out after the pilot if we didn't provide the value we said we we're gonna do. Um, but if they didn't explicitly cancel the contracts, they turned uh, into a, a license model. And that was our actual revenue model, which is still our revenue model today. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing about that is that you, uh, you know, if, if you have someone on the customer side who is not really interested in the problem you're actually solving, uh, then they kind of will kick back and push back more on that type of structure of, of the agreement. Mm -hmm. So you kind of forced, like, you know, if you forbid yourself to sign a contract that's just a pilot, uh, you're forced to speak to the to the real problem owner instead of a uh, you know innovation officer who who gets you know promoted based on the number of projects they run, for example. Great, great takeaways. And I think it summarizes also the very philosophy that Ignite is uh, always preaching, uh, that uh, if you can solve a real problem, you should also get, of course, uh, paid for solving that. Otherwise, as a startup, you never know that it's bringing some real value uh, in the end. So uh, we are moving on. I know that this is also, you know, live broadcast it on YouTube and it will stay there actually forever or anyway, as long as YouTube is there probably. So if you would like to look at this uh, later on, there are a lot of possibilities to do that. Now I would like to welcome our next startup up on stage and that's uh, Greenlytics and Sebastian. Sebastian, are you here? Yes, I'm here, can you hear me? Super, yeah, loud and clear. Great. Take it away. Thank you. Okay, so uh, my name is Sebastian. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of, of a startup called Greenlytics. We're uh, a weather analysis company targeting the power and utility industry. Next. So what we do is basically we combine three fields of, of te technology or expertise, metrology, data science, and the energy system. And this is really the core of our uh, company. Next. So what we do is that we developed a platform that we call the Greenlytics platform which is basically a, a AI toolbox that helps you um, speed up the development of weather analytics applications. But in this talk, I will talk more about an application of this that we did together with the customer. Next. Uh, one back. Um, so this is the Luden, this is a, a, a um, ABB site, industrial uh, factory uh, in Ludenscheid in Western Germany. Uh, that's called Buschjäger. So they basically, it's a factory, they make uh, power, fashionable power switches and, and knobs. 
Uh, and what they decided to do is install a 1.5 megawatt peak uh, solar plant on top of the uh, parking lot. And they also have some charging of electric vehicles, they have some battery on place, and they have some flexibility in their, in their production of load, load schedules. So this all becomes a quite intricate energy uh, optimization problem. Uh, and ABB, they have an optimization toolbox uh, to do this that they call Optimax. Uh, and what they wanted from us was a solar power forecast so that they can uh, make a prognosis of the solar power and use that as a base of optimization to reduce energy cost, increase sustainability of the site and reliability as well. Next. So what we did was we, that we developed SolarMind, our tool to forecast, visualize and optimize the process of solar power generation. Next. So uh, basically, this is what it ended up being. So we take in um, data from satellites and numerical weather prediction models. Then we process that using physical equations. So uh, physical engineering equations, as well as AI technologies. And in this case, we use the gradient boosting decision tree. Uh, and then we produce the, uh, the forecast uh, for the coming uh, days in advance. Next. But the first step of this was really to try our forecasting AI, pure AI technology on a benchmarking test case that we found on Kaggle. And when we benchmarked our AI, we saw that we actually would have ended up in second place in a Kaggle competition out of several data scientists and researchers. Next. But when we compare this with the performance that we achieved at the AI at the Bush Jagger site, uh, next. You can see that the result that we got in the, in the competition was much better. So we were wondering, of course, why is this the case? And when we plotted this as a function of the training data that we had, and we realized that at the Bush Jagger case, in the ABB case, we had much less data available. So when we did a sensitivity analysis, next, you can see how, as we remove data from the algorithm, the performance degrades. So this was all reasonable to us, but we weren't happy with this because we wanted to be able to deliver a good uh, forecast to ABB optimization engine, either, even in the regime of little uh, training data. Next. So what we did was that we developed in conjunction with the AI technologies, physical equations, engineering equations, putting in as a prior to the AI model to reduce the forecasting accuracy in the regime of low um, training data. And we call this SolarMind Plus. Uh, with this, uh, yeah, next. So we can reduce the, 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 um, the error with 30%. Next. Uh, so this was a reduction in error with 30%, uh, as well as a reduction of the greenhouse gas emissions by 15% at this site. Uh, next. We also did some calculations uh, by like basically simulating the whole site uh, and the profitability of that site. And we saw that we could increase the profit uh, by 10% uh, by doing so. Next. Uh, we de developed uh, the, the interface and the visualization uh, as a part of this pilot. Next. And we also participated in the ABB Industrial AI Accelerator and uh, were the winner in the end out of more than 100 participating startups, uh, applying startups from all over Europe. Next. So, that, so thank you so much. And I'd be happy to talk more about uh, this uh, and other applications of uh, weather analytics uh, next day, tomorrow with you. Thank you so much, Sebastian. And next up, are we ready, Stina? Let me see if we have any questions for you. We have no open questions here. If you could address uh, just really quickly uh, what uh, call to action to all the attendees out there, Sebastian, who do you want to get in contact with tomorrow morning? Okay, um, so we are looking for, um, companies in the energy utility space, uh, especially energy and water, uh, that all have business processes that are dependent on weather somehow. Uh, so all uh, customers that have this, uh, we'll be happy to talk with. Specifically, we, we look for big corporates that could help use our uh, technology uh, in their products and then uh, develop new 
uh, unique uh, um, basically selling point for their customers and help us scale uh, on an international market. Perfect. And I, we will push for that, Sebastian. And hopefully you have an email or another. So let's move on. Sina. Yes, I, I also have a reminder, actually, in the audience now, we have quite many investors as well. So, uh, Sebastian, I'm sure that you're looking forward to meeting them tomorrow as well, yeah, right? Definitely. You're much welcome to reach out. Great. And the uh, next startup up, please. Welcome to the stage, Sense, Iman. Hi, uh, you hear me? Perfectly well. Nice. Stage is yours. Uh, so hi everyone, my name is Iman Bakili from Sensept and I'm gonna present our intelligent radars for autonomous mining. Next slide, please. Uh, so we all have the experience of driving in the fog. It's dangerous and we have to drive slow which reduces our productivity and makes uh, an existence of unsafe scenario. Mines are similar, they are dark and dusty, which reduces their productivity and makes it an unsafe uh, and dangerous place for human and machine interactions. And the only way to improve productivity as well as safety is to go towards autonomous mining. Uh, next slide, please. So all the autonomous systems rely heavily rely on multiple sensors, for instance, LIDARs, cameras, and radars. And radars among all, all sensors is the most uh, robust sensor in, in different weather conditions or lighting conditions. For instance, fog, rain, snow, or smoke, they have negligible uh, uh, impact on radar performance. Uh, apart from those, we have quite good speed me measurement with radars. For instance, we can find really small movements using radars. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so at Sensept, we build uh, a radar sensors, hardware and software. So the hardware is our platform, but our focus is software. Uh, so what we do, we make a 4D detection, meaning we can find 3D location plus the movements of the objects. So what we make is the image in the middle. We can make a 3D image of the surrounding plus the movements. And uh, next, please. And, and since we have this high resolution image and an accurate image, then we can use it to actually classify the types of targets. For instance, saying that this is a human in the vicinity of, the, of, the, of like mining equipment. Uh, next, please. So uh, when it comes to AI, uh, machine learning can significantly improve the sensing reliability in, in radars, especially. Because radars, unlike other sensors, uh, the, the has like special features for different targets in, in raw data. So before even doing any processing, we have a lot of different things that we can use for machine learning. But if you want to use it like, let's say, analytically, we have to spend a lot of computation power and, uh, and it will be really complex and it's probably not reusable. So uh, by extracting these kind of features and using machine learning, we can, we can immediately find the type of target in the middle of like other targets and in dense environment. Uh, one example is, uh, for instance, human walking. If you look at the uh, top right figure, uh, this is like what we can see uh, as like a Doppler frequency uh, changes over time uh, for a human walking. So if the human walks, this is how the radar sees it. Uh, so you see it's very different from what we see from a camera or LiDAR sensor. Uh, and if we can use this low level type of data and features, then we can really uh, say what it is. And, and uh, the thing is uh, also like uh, unlike other sensors, we have to use uh, a combination of like traditional methods like SVM and also like new methods like or newer methods like neural networks to classify targets. And the other issue like when it comes to uh, um, classification is hard hardware dependency. Uh, for, uh, and especially for radars, we have really like large hardware dependency when we do classification. So what we are doing, we are trying to use simulations to actually remove and deconvolve hardware dependency. At this moment, we are using radar only, uh, but in the future, we will do sensor fusion and use other sensors also for classifications. Our next step is to be in a pilot with an OEM uh, in mining or automotive or construction industries uh, to, to improve our data sets and to 
more develop our software platform. And with that, I, will, I want to thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Iman. Uh, so uh, one question from uh, the chat is, what is the platform that your product is on, hardware or software? Uh, so we, we have like uh, both, uh, our, our novelty is on the hardware, but as I mentioned, the hardware is, is our, our like maybe the platform that we use for our like software and signal processing. So, so it's like a combination of both, I would say. Perfect. So uh, one more question uh, is, is there any collaboration for you with the auto industry outside of EU? Right uh, now? No, not right now. So, and uh, then my follow-up has to be, do you wish to collaborate with anyone, your dream customer or anyone who you want to reach out for in this format? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, as I mentioned, we are looking to collaborations uh, with OEMs. Uh, so from mining and construction automotive, uh, whether they are in Europe or outside Europe, uh, all of them are perfect and most welcome. Perfect. Thank you so much, Iman. Uh, and uh, to all of you out there, I mean, this is what we really love to do, co to connect the startups with the uh, possibilities for a collaboration. So if you have anyone you uh, know who could help the startups, please uh, contact us or the start startup right away to get the connection. Let's move on to our next Mavenoid. Are you ready? Yes, I am. The stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, so I thought I'd uh, go a little bit the other way around. I'll start with the case. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about us uh, afterwards. And the case is a very strange one, uh, which one which I didn't think I would, a use case I didn't think we would have you know, 30 days ago. How do you strengthen customer support during a lockdown? Uh, next slide, please. And uh, the case in particular is a washing machine maker uh, based in Germany, but with operations in Italy, Spain, uh, all over Europe. And we're facing uh, two kind of super urgent uh, problems. Uh, next slide, please. Problem number one was, maybe not so surprisingly, how do you replace physical support with, with virtual support? Uh, you know, you can't do on-site visits when a dishwasher or when a washing machine uh, breaks and the customers, you know, can't come to you even if they, even if they could. Uh, so this is obviously something you need to address very fast. And next slide, please. The other acute challenge was flatten the curve, if you will, flatten the curve of support cases, luckily in this case. And what that means is, you know, people have a leaking washing machine. Uh, they actually have to do something about it, or at least the issue needs to be addressed instantly. Like you can't just not do that. Uh, how can you spread that out over time? And how can you reduce the volume of those uh, uh, requests that are coming in, given that you have much fewer people that are able to handle those requests, even by phone? Uh, next slide, please. So the summary of the challenge was, OK, we need to go virtual. Uh, we need to flatten the curve of support cases. And you know, we can't do this by June or July. We need to do this in, in days. Uh, next slide, please. So really the key insight here was that if you're gonna serve more requests with fewer people, uh, the only way for that equation to really compute or really balance is if you introduce automation. And the reason for that is because you know, from the customer's point of view, automation, like if you do support automation, uh, it really moves the needle because um, uh, you can give, for example, instant response rather than waiting in a queue for an unacceptable amount of time. And from the company's point of view, uh, you can, you know, if you actually manage to automate some requests, that's 40 times, 50 times, 100 times cheaper than even remote service, not to speak about field service. So it's something that can really move the needle, uh, whereas, you know, just going Zoom or, or something like that, it, it has a huge impact, but um, not nearly as much. You don't get as much bang for your buck. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please, in case you didn't hear me. Thank you. Um, so automation here means self-service. Uh, so it's not just an FAQ, but how can you actually give AI-guided self-service to customers who are calling in with technical problems uh, of a washing machine. Um, next slide, please. 
So this is our solution. So we built a smart product assistant available across all different support channels. And it doesn't just do triage, which people start to get familiar with that term now in these times, uh, or you know, deployment, installation, how do I use my product? But it also does actual troubleshooting. Uh, and troubleshooting is kind of the hard AI problem that uh, is responsible for the vast amount of time uh, that support teams spend uh, in this case. Um, so that's really where most of our efforts went to. Uh, next slide, please. And this is kind of the summary of the solution. So we, we did a, a platform for, for automated tech support, uh, integrated with a bunch of different support channels, uh, basically all of them except voice. Uh, when people emailed in or when they texted in or uh, went to the website. Um, and then when we uh, solved the problem, we created a ticket in the ticket system, in the CRM system. Uh, if we didn't manage to solve a problem, we escalated it. And then it's very important that you escalate it to the right person um, and uh, making sure that it's a person that actually knows that particular dish, that particular washing machine uh, that, uh, that the customer calls in about. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll give you uh, just a quick intro about us. Uh, we work with a bunch of companies. Uh, it's mostly technology companies. Uh, all of them are uh, manufacturers of different sorts. Um, next slide, please. And uh, our, what we're doing is we're automating uh, technical product support. Uh, we just raised uh, $8 million before this uh, crisis started. Uh, we raised $10, $10 million in total. Uh, and you know, we, we have shifted our focus over time from only focus on industrial kind of complex machines uh, to now do drones, uh, you know, robotic lawnmowers, consumer electronics, uh, speakers, uh, a much broader range of products. Uh, and next slide, please. And uh, I noticed that somebody asked for a CTA. Uh, so our CTA is actually, we're opening our product up for free uh, until the end of the year. Uh, we have a lot of requests coming in from both existing and, uh, and, new, and new clients. Uh, and people are asking how we can help them uh, alleviate some of the pressure from the support teams. Uh, so we're offering what we call Maven or Professional, the details of which are, you know, it's a slight, slightly more light version of our product uh, for free until, until the end of the year. If you're interested in this offer, you can, you can email me, uh, slilia at maven.com. Thanks for your patience and your time. Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, so we have a question uh, for you uh, to wrap this up. If you would uh, pick a low-hanging fruit for corporates to automate, where would you suggest them to start looking? Oh, I love that question because <laughs> I do actually have a strong view on that. Um, so in, when we look at our data, 65% of the time people spend on, on tech support is spent troubleshooting, which is something that's usually quite surprising even for, for heads of customer service. Uh, so if there was a single low hanging fruit, like if there was something where, you know, you, you make even a slight improvement, but it would have a massive impact on your, all your KPIs basically in your, in your support org, it would be to automate some of your troubleshooting requests, which, you know, the status quo is that you assume that if it's a troubleshooting request, uh, a human has to handle it, but it's not the case. Thank you so much. Uh, great answer. Uh, and uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, remember to keep them coming on the Q&A. Thank you so much. A big hand for you from the team here uh, online uh, and uh, from the, all the attendees, I think as well. So now I think it's time to have a small break again. Uh, so if you need any support from us, raise your hand, let us know, address any questions or chat. Uh, but there is a break now and uh, we will be back here shortly. Fill up your coffees and uh, we are starting again at uh, about five minutes and then we will discuss how to invest in AI. See you really soon.
So, uh, welcome back. This is uh, quite interesting. We thought that online everything will go much faster, but it's quite the opposite. But luckily we, we don't have to run that long to, to get coffee, right? So, I'm very happy to introduce this uh, last uh, session for the day. But I just want to give a heads up. Hang on, because after this session is, is over, we will open for a digital mingle where we will open for all of you to actually reach out to one another and, and private chat messages. So you will be able to rename your, your uh, user and you will be able to find each other. And I think there are quite good networking opportunities available here, uh, since I know that you are about 100 participants at the moment and from all over the world. And the main focus are startups and corporates and, uh, and uh, investors. So I think you're a really super audience. So please um, take the opportunity to stay after the session is over and, and to meet each other. Now I want to hand over actually the moderating role to Peter uh, from AI Thank Innovations of Sweden. Thank you so much, Tina. Uh, and hi, everyone. Um, really good to be here. And this is so fun talking about AI directly from home. Uh, so I'm here in, in Gothenburg, uh, and I represent AI Innovation of Sweden. And we will talk about that in the program a bit further uh, during the day. But with me today is I brought a couple of investors. So with me today here is John Ilvesjö um, from uh, Brightly Ventures. Are you here, John? I am. Can you hear me? Great. Oh, nice to see you as well. And Tanya Horowitz, partner at Butterfly Ventures. You're here as well. Can you hear us, Tanya? I can hear you. Hello. Great. Hi. And William Iltoft from Nordzone. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, so, so the structure of this panel will be that we will go through a couple of questions, uh, the investors will introduce themselves, uh, we will go through their um, basic, their investment strategy, uh, how, what they think about, what do they prioritize when investing in AI, and also, of course, address the elephant in the room, the current situation with Corona. Uh, and then there will be some minutes to, to um, uh, ask questions from the audience. Uh, but I would like a short introduction from all of the uh, investors. So I would like to start with you, Tanya. Yeah, sure. So uh, Tanya Harwitz, partner at Butterfly Ventures. Um, we are the leading seed stage uh, science-based deep tech and harbor investor in the Nordics. Uh, we've uh, actually been investing since 2012 from our initial fund. Um, I actually joined uh, Butterfly for their third fund back in 2016. Uh, we now have 24 companies in our third fund. And we are, again, quite early investors. So we get in um, even as early as pre-seed. Um, a lot of times we invest alongside angels or uh, in the case of here in Sweden, it would be Almi, for example. Um, so, you know, we're very accustomed to following the journey from the beginning to, to hopefully, you know, close to the end. Um, and we, again, we're very, very interested in, in what, what I would call science-based deep tech. Um, so a lot of our companies are actually based um, on uh, technologies that, that uh, originate from university research, for example. Um, so just as an example. Um, and John, how about Brightly? What's Brightly's role? So uh, Brightly Ventures, I noticed there's a T missing, I think, in the Brightly Ventures name there under under my, my picture. Uh, but Brightly Ventures, anyways, we're a, um, a young uh, early stage fund based in Stockholm, but um, covering all of Sweden. And um, uh, we invest early stage. Um, so we also... Um, we were broad sector, but AI and deep tech is definitely one of the sectors that we uh, spend a lot of time on. Um, we made six investments uh, last year, and we will probably be making uh, six or seven investments per year in the next couple of years. Um, and uh, we have quite operational background team as well. So we've, we've built companies ourselves and made uh, successful exits, and, uh, and we've been investors for a while as well. So. Um, and William, 
uh, Nordzone is uh, a recognized player in the Swedish ecosystem. But, uh, tell me about your role. Um, yeah, I can give you a quick update on Nordzone as well. So we're, we're actually one of Europe's oldest VC funds, almost 25 years in the making. And, and we started out in the Nordics, we started out in Norway, um, headquartered in London these days. So uh, we have an office of about 13, 14 people in London and we're seven people in Stockholm and three in New York. And uh, we're not really a deep tech investor. We invest primarily in software. Sometimes, you know, there's a, there's a layer of deep tech involved there, sometimes not. Um, and we've been proud to, to back really great entrepreneurs. Um, John with, with Toby was, was one of them. Um, Yay. <laughs> 10 plus years ago, yeah. So, um, <laughs> Uh, and I, uh, I've been with Northson for uh, for a year and a half. I uh, work out of the Stockholm office, um, look at companies across every sector, um, and work closely with with the PJ, one of our partners here in the in Nordics. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what I want to go through is um, the 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 theme for this was to say, okay, what to how to invest in AI, what to think about. Uh, and uh, Tanya, you're, um, you and Butterfly are, are really early stage. You do even pre-seed investments. So I would like to start with you because you, you are there from the beginning. Uh, what, what are you thinking about when looking at AI cases and, and how do you define deep tech? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously deep tech is like just one of those, you know, those terms that have evolved over the years. Um, but, but again, you know, we, we try to... Um, really differentiate our deal flow um, with regards to you know, what that deep tech might look like. Again, it could be research coming out of a university and we do invest you know, across the entire Nordic region and the Baltic. So we see a tremendous amount of deal flow. I mean, probably about a, you know, upwards of thousand deals a year um, and maybe invest in eight to 10. Um, so we have to be quite selective. So the criteria that we, we look at at such an early stage is absolutely the technology. Um, it, it's, it's the team. Um, so does, can the team execute? Um, and if the team doesn't have the proper um, uh, team member to, to execute, we try to help them through that journey and to find the, the proper team member to help them execute. Because a lot of times when we get companies, sometimes it is just maybe one or two or three people that have an, um, you know, worked on a PhD um, assignment for, for some example, um, you know, sometimes they are a little bit further along. Sometimes they might have a proof of concept, might, sometimes they might have customers. Um, and we, we started seeing that kind of move along a little bit over the years since we first started investing in 2012. Our last current fund that we're investing out of, um, I would say about 50% of them have some sort of um, research or science based behind it. Several AI cases in particular, um, the last two investments we did in Sweden, um, which I led, um, were, um, were AI um, driven, um, both research back, back, backed and based from uh, universities here in Sweden. Um, the last Norwegian case we invested in was, is also an AI that was actually not born out of, of a university, um, but it is, it is AI driven. Um, so, you know, we, we are starting to see a lot more of this, um, but again, technology, team, and what I would say um, is super important is market. So AI has to have a marketplace, um, it's got to be a global marketplace, and that's our last criteria. Yeah, um, and John, Brightly sweet spot, what is that? Uh, well, uh... Deep tech is very broad. Uh, as Tanya, I don't, I'm not super f fond of the, the term in itself. Uh, but um, we look at AI and other parts of deep tech uh, quite quite actively. We're a little bit later as an investor, um, typically investing five to fifteen million Swedish as a as a first ticket. Um, when evaluating AI uh, startups, it's 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 always difficult. I mean, knowledge is key. The team is super important to rather have a, a great team with a not so great idea um, than the opposite. So it's, um, it's always about the team. Um, what we see a lot in kind of the stage where we look at companies is that the, the application of the AI is many times even more important than the, the basic 
technology or background of the innovation or the technology in itself. Um, and I think that that will be key for AI machine learning applications um, going forward. What value do they bring? What alternative routes to solving the same problem um, are there? Um, so that's something that we spend a lot of time on. Uh, we'd rather um, look at something that may be a, a more simplistic solution, but to a bigger uh, problem than the other way around. So, uh, but there are ma many ways to, to look at it, many ways to evaluate it. Uh, but I think um, our, our key from, um, from Brightway is that we have operational experience. We have a, a very strong R&D community around us as investors. So we tend to, to piggyback on that, both for deal sourcing and for evaluating the, uh, the investees that, uh, the potential uh, investees that, that approach us. Yeah. Um, and William, except for John, investing in John and, uh, and those good companies. But how do you view the, the AI field or the AI space? Well, it's a good question. Um, and just for context, we, we typically come in a bit later than, than uh, Tanya and John. So we, we uh, our sweet spot is Series A. That is somewhere between five and $20 million. Sometimes yeah. it's a bit earlier than that. And I think what's really important once you get there is that you have um, you know, some sort of product market fit. So rather than looking at you know, AI, we probably look at the product and whether, you know, they have managed to productize the AI and also commercialize it. And uh, to give you a tangible example, we invested last year in, in SpaceMaker, which is a company out of Oslo that is in construction tech. And I mean, the, the product is, is driven by AI, but it's not the AI itself we invest in. We invest in the team and, and, and the product that they've built with the help of AI. So, uh, um, so for us, it's more about, you know, how they productize it and, and how they <clears throat> how they manage to commercialize the product. Yeah. Seeing that yeah. we come in at, at a much later stage. Yeah, yeah. Um, would you say, and, and this is a discussion among you three um, and just a, a kind of uh, overall question, uh, would you see, see that the technology differs in, in different types of stages uh, where, where Tanya, you are more focused maybe on the, the technology side uh, where, where at the other end, uh, William and Norton are more focused on the market side. Or is, it, is the technology equally important? Um, I, I guess I'll start. I mean, the, the, the technology is super important because it's a differentiator, we believe, at such an early stage. Um, but absolutely, I mean, one of the three criteria that we look at is, is, is market potential. Uh, and a lot of things that we do, and, and particularly myself, um, my role uh, in, in Butterfly is to reach out to some of our corporate partners or potential end use customers um, to try to have an understanding with them even before we maybe even invest. Um, you know, what, what's the market looking like for a product like this or, or a solution like this? Um, is it needed? Is it necessary? Is it going to solve your problems? Um, and if, if, you know, we get a resounding, yes, this is something we really need, um, then we might continue look, looking further, of course, into, into the case. And just to continue there on uh, Tanya's note, I mean, tech for us as a differentiator is super important. And I think, um, you know, it's one of, one, of the, one of the things that we really look at when we invest in companies. Um, we, we always, you know, kind of scratch our head and ask ourselves, what's the, what's the differentiation here? And oftentimes that is, that is tech, right? So, so we love these deep tech companies. Um, but when you're at the stage where you're raising, you know, between five, 15, 20 million dollars, you must have commercialized the product to, to, to the sense that you can actually, you know, see real uh, commercial traction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then uh, regarding commercial uh, attraction and the current situation, because we have to address that. Um, I want to know, okay, what's the discussion around your table uh, right now, uh, back at your firms? Uh, how do you approach the situation? Has, has it has, uh, had this huge impact uh, that we all feel it had? We can start with you, John. What's Brightly's uh, take on, on the, the COVID situation? 
Yeah, well, we we had to take a, a step back and and uh, just for a couple of days uh, and gather the team, go through everything that we've gathered information wise, uh, uh, and form an opinion both on the the virus itself, with the financial consequences, um, both short term and, and long term. Um, everything has changed, and then when we go through our strategy uh, that we we had before this COVID nineteen situation. Uh, everything is still true. So we make some minor changes to how we look at um, uh, investment, um, both the type of deals that we will participate in, the kind of criteria that we have for 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 founders, what kind of qualities that we'll be looking extra uh, looking extra at. Uh, but end of the day, uh, as early stage tech investors. Um, I think um, tech is definitely part of the solution here uh, going forward uh, and tech is going to be as or even more relevant going forward even post this this crisis. So our our general strategy doesn't change, but when we look at a specific deal, uh, runway, qualities within the, the management of the companies and those things, that's where we have made kind of some adjustments to to our criterias. But end of day, we will still be uh, as active, making the investments, uh, um, looking for great companies uh, and deep tech and AI specifically will definitely be something that becomes relative to other sectors, uh, even more important for us and, and more relevant for us for, for, for looking. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And before I, before I answer, um, I have to, apologize because I feel like I'm back in New York because there's a bunch of honky going outside. So I hope you guys don't hear that. But (laughs) anyway, um, so we've, we, as, as John and his team have done, you know, taken uh, a hard look at what's happened over the past couple of weeks. We've actually had um, personal conversations with each one of our portfolio companies, all 24, um, to kind of assess their situation um, and, and, you know, try to figure out, do they have the runway to, you know, to last, of course, you know, when you're a very early stage, um, company, sometimes, you know, the, the capital is super important and may, maybe that you're not, your revenues are not coming in quite yet. So if we need to help support them through this, you know, we've had to take a hard look at that as well. Um, you know, which companies are going to be most, um, affected by it, for example, um, we've actually said that we are not going to make, be making any more investments um, during this time period, just to kind of see what's you know what's happening. Because we're in a little bit different. We're three years into our fund, so we're almost completely done. We have a few more to go that are in closing. Um, you know, just from our side, and then you know, there's some companies that um, have asked for our, our help. And hey, what should we? You know, how should we look at this? What should we do? And we're, of course, we're always open and, and helpful to to those companies. Um, but I, I agree with John wholeheartedly that technology is going to be the winner here. I mean, we have uh, about a third of our portfolio that's in um, health tech, med tech, and quite a few of those I think are going to really flourish actually, not only today, but also maybe even providing solutions for what's happening with COVID. Um, it may not be seen today, but maybe next year, for example. Um, so that's super encouraging for those guys. Yep. And William, I know you had some thoughts about meeting startups and meeting the founders. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and, and, you know, what Tonya and John says really res- resonates with us as well. Um, obviously, we can't meet, uh, meet with founders in the same way we have, um, you know, during the winter and early parts of the spring, but we still have meetings online. Um, that doesn't change. Obviously, we're spending an increasing amount of time with our, our portfolio companies. We've done, you know, risk assessments with all of them and um, running through, you know, their funding requirements and whatnot. So I think that this is this is a really good time to have an experienced um, investor on your cap table. And I think a lot of our partners have seen both, you know, the, the financial crisis of 28, but also the dot-com bubble and the Asian crisis before that. So, so there's some experience around the table. Um, but we're still open for, for business in the sense that we still do investments. We're still looking at a lot of deals. Um, I think there's definitely a, a higher bar, but I also think that companies that can go out and raise in this environment um, and, and 
be ready to kind of excel out of this downturn whenever that you know whenever the tide turns will be super well positioned so yeah. i think and also i think some of the best companies you know we see today were were founded during the financial crisis so i think there's lots of opportunity as well yeah yeah um, and to end the discussion uh, amongst uh, in this panel, I, I would like to hear your view about having uh, corporate ventures or, uh, or corporate venture capital in, in startups as private investors. Uh, what's your view it's on that? Because pro problem on my side or not? Oh, something happened. Um, so, so what's your view on, on having corporate ventures in, in uh, startups? Um, is that a good thing or is it limiting? John? We might have lost John. Uh, Tanya? <laughs> okay. A de facto, I'll go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so corporate, I mean, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, we have a lot of corporate relationships um, and, and CVCs have been, um, as, as you know, very, very active um, past couple of years in terms of um, being investors. Um, a lot of times they will not invest, obviously, as early as we get in. Um, but they are still great sounding boards. I use the corporate venturing arms and, and then of course the, the business units of the corporates that I know, um, like I said, to assess um, investments. Um, they appreciate it because obviously we're bringing them potential new technologies for solutions for them that they might see early on and, and they'll keep an eye on them and maybe they'll do a proof of concept with them even now. Um, so it's a win-win situation for both them and the startup, of course. Um, from an investment perspective, I mean, absolutely, there's always pros and cons. I mean, you have to kind of pick a horse, but I, but I guess if, you know, if they're, if they're an um, investor in the Series A and beyond, for example, um, you know, I don't particularly see it, you know, it really depends on what type of company it is and, and if there's other, if there's any um, exclusivity and, and other restrictions that that might come with that investment. And that's what I would, you know, tell any investor uh, I'm sorry, any, any founder to look at when making, um, having an investment in from a corporate. Um, are they going to be able to help you? Will they shelve you? If you think they're going to shelve you, then we, you know, we need to have a deeper conversation. Um, but if they're going to help you along the journey, and a lot of times those investments turn into acquisitions. Um, so that's always a good thing too. Um, so it, it, it it's just depends. It just depends on who it is and, and what the, the company is that they're doing, uh, what the company does. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Tanya. I mean, um, I think as a founder, you have to you know look long and hard to understand what you want to build and see if that aligns with whatever investors you have um, around the table or who want to be part of the uh, of, of the journey. I think that's probably the most important thing um, you can look at as, an, as, a, as a founder. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so co to conclude the, the panel here, um, uh, you look at the tech, uh, you look at the team and you look at the potential market, of course, uh, but what do startups do to reach out to you? How do they get to got to get in contact with you? Well, I mean, it's it's pretty easy for for Mario. You can just go on LinkedIn <laughs> and find me, or you can go to our website, Butterfly.vc, and you can pick myself, who handles Sweden, Norway, Denmark, um, or if it happens to be a Finnish company or in the Baltics, my my team um, in Finland takes care of those. Um, but it's Tanya at Butterfly.vc. If anybody's listening and wants to reach out, happy to happy to happy to listen. Yeah, likewise. I mean, uh, just just shoot, shoot us an email. Um, this the Swedish team. It's um, it's me. It's my colleagues Maxine, Marcus, and Henrik. So uh, our, our email is pretty straightforward. It's just first name at northzone.com. So don't be a stranger. Oh, great. The same goes for <laughs> Brightly Ventures. So uh, we're all first name at uh, brightlyventures.com. So feel free to send an email. Check out our web for our portfolio and what we do and who we are. Great. 
Thank you so much, John, Tanya, and William. Uh, and I'm sure there's a bunch of more questions, but you'll get them on email. Thank you so much. Yes, there thank are. You. Thanks for putting this together. <laughs> thank you so thank, much, thank Peter, you. as well. Thanks. And uh, thank you to William, Tanya, and John. Thank you, Peter. And uh, we will get back to you shortly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. but before that, we are about to have one more session with the startup, actually session number three. And are we ready to start uh, that one? Sentian, Martin, are you ready? Are you with us? And remember the Q&A, we have some questions here and we will try to have time to address them. If not here online, we will try to connect with you later on. Martin, we can't really hear you right now. Uh, maybe try to unmute. Yeah. There you I, are. Um, right, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Are you ready? I am ready. So, uh, uh, my name is Martin Rufeldt. I'm the CEO and founder of Sentient.ai. And we help large industrial companies transform through artificial intelligence. Uh, we are focused only on industrial companies and we really try to push the boundaries of what is possible with AI for industrial companies. And we have a lot of experience that we put into our R&D, founded by four guys that made another AI exit to eBay actually. And we're now uh, 20 plus AI experts. Next, please. Uh, we have three products, uh, predictive maintenance and anomaly detection for large um, implementations and distributed assets. We also have our ICON, Intelligent Control and Optimization Solution, which helps to boost uh, control systems with AI and add intelligence to automation systems for higher yield and, and quality. And we have our own intelligent optimization solutions, which uh, actually is a recently uh, broke the world record in, in nonlinear optimization. And we do that in the area of planning, logistics, and supply chain, among other things. We do this from cloud to edge, uh, and I think we should go for next. Um, we have a very strong technical foundation. Uh, we have our model-based reinforcement learning engine for our intelligent control system. We have our intelligent automation solution with very high efficiency, which even works with little data. And as mentioned just briefly, world leading in optimization, where we do that in nonlinear optimization, actually broke a world record there recently. And we add automatic ML to our solutions to, to uh, improve them. So if you go to the next one, I wanted to talk about a case. Uh, in this case, it's uh, Yumo. Uh, it's a high tech sensor manufacturer and we have implemented our intelligent automation in their production line. Next, please. Uh, in their manufacturing process, they had uh, a, uh, a small but significant process variation. And by adding then AI to the automation and control system, uh, the goal was to uh, reduce this variation and improve the sensor accuracy and overall yield. Um, the challenge was that there wasn't much data and, and this variation that they had that drifted over time and it was pretty complex uh, setup. And the, there was a time lag of several weeks before we could get the, the proper feedback loop. So, uh, and, and this is not a problem that only Yuma has. This is a very common problem uh, with these uh, variation inputs uh, and settings and so on. And you will find that in paper mills, aluminum production, oil well optimization, mining, and so on. Um, and what we did in this case, we, uh, we did a solution that adapts to these varying conditions. Uh, and we do that by using a number of different models. We, um, uh, among other things, also used AutoML in this case uh, to speed up the development and the adaptations to the system. So if you go to the next, uh, so why use uh, AutoML? Well, uh, it can be beneficial when it's just not enough to, to learn from data uh, and, and you have to adapt to varying conditions um, and also helps when you want to do, produce something uh, quicker. Um, so um, that's why we used it in this case um, and uh, you can go to the next. So the end result, well, we very successful. We increased their uh, productivity and, and the number of uh, 
the sensors that went to the highest uh, A quality with 20%. And um, uh, which has now been scaled up uh, to other sensors. Uh, so it's uh, AI in production and, and at scale. Just want to finish off with, with some other examples uh, of our capabilities and implementations. And uh, that could be interesting, like optimization for control system uh, of chemical plants and power plants, workforce planning uh, optimization, large teams and the predictive maintenance and anomaly detection for power plants, buildings, railways, and so on. Yes, I think um, that was it. So thanks. Uh, and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Martin. Uh, so let's see if we have any questions. We don't have any open questions uh, right now. Uh, so for me, uh, once again, I'm kind of repeating myself, but I think this is a really good way of uh, put a call to action uh, about who do you want to reach out? Which, what email do you want in your inbox tomorrow morning from your dream customer or any person that could help you go further? Well, we'd be very happy if there was some manufacturing companies or process industry companies that uh, felt they wanted to talk to us. Um, so um, uh, hopefully we'll have a few of those. And um, uh, there are a lot of different AI problems out there uh, that needs to be addressed. Um, so whether you are in predictive maintenance or if you are trying to optimize your production uh, or if you you have challenges with a complex optimization uh, challenges. Well, we are here. We're here to help. Perfect. Thank you so much. And we actually get a, a chat here that might help you. So we will get you to in contact. So it's actually happening uh, things in the chat, just so you know, uh, there are action going on. And we are about, thank you so much, Martin, uh, a big hand mm -hmm. for you from me and the team and everyone else. Uh, are we ready for our next startup, Talkomatic? Are you with me, uh, Andreas? Yes, I'm here. Do you hear me? I hear you very good. So the oh, stage geez. is yours. Thank you. So uh, I'm Andreas Krona from Tokomatic, and uh, Tokomatic creates the next generation of conversational AI today. Next slide, please. Um, I think we can all agree that dialogue is key to human behavior, and it has been so for around 200,000 years or so. And uh, Tokomatic has, uh, through deep research and experience, found a key to more human AI dialogue. We are experts in conversational AI and we're offering a solution for dialogue between human and machine using all terms or all human means of communication. So that includes uh, speech, text, images, uh, gestures, signals, etc. And we do the, all this uh, language independently. Next slide, please. Uh, a human-centric approach is of highest value in every successful dialogue project. And Tokomatic's uh, dialogue first, user first as processes to fully support this approach. And while we also enable accessibility through existing platforms and infrastructures, such as Amazon Alexa, Google Assistant, IBM Watson, phone, web, etc. And next slide, please. So the case study I will present today is uh, taken from the automotive world. Is that my voice starting or sorry about that, but um, yeah, the case that I will present today is uh, from the automotive world where one of our clients currently struggling with the value of owning your own voice. And uh, yeah, now we're on the right slide. So typically many corporates do choose a technology platform. And based on that, ch that choice is started creating content and the solutions. In the case of our client, one question that was raised once the platform was in place was, what if someone steals our voice? And uh, this could mean that a third party workshop supplier pays, pays the platform owner to be the first choice when our drivers have a vehicle problem or anything like that. So, and knowing that the aftermarket is a very valuable source of income, this was a serious threat. And uh, okay, now we're on the right slide again. So mm -hmm. sorry for any confusion. And our customer reached out to us to ask if we could create a dialogue that made sure the driver was guided to the nearest official brand workshop instead of any third party supplier. And we created a solution where, the, where they, where we together built a brand specific dialogue inside of the platform. So by using our TDM dialogue engine as a brain inside of the voice platform, 
we managed to do this in a well-functioning way, but also expand the dialogue beyond what was expected to come from the platform itself. And now the next slide, please. So on top of that, we also added some additional value that was made possible thanks to the features of our dialogue engine. So we added a second dialogue, which in this case was a climate control. And this showed that it was possible to jump freely between different dialogues and for the system to keep track of the different dialogues and the status of the dialogues. And uh, once a driver booked an appointment, we had the assistant offering a complimentary snack to the driver. And this showed the power of dialogue in service situations to actually give something extra. And this would make the driver have something more positive to think about than uh, the broken truck when coming to the workshop. And when we delivered the project to the customer, we had created not only the English version that was uh, initially planned, but we also created a Swedish language version. And uh, we did this with the knowledge that the original platform or the voice platform that was used did not support Swedish language. And uh, we managed to enable this by giving access to the dialogue through a regular phone number. And this regular phone number is key to showing another thing also, and that means that and maybe more importantly, that uh, instead of only offering the solution to uh, the 50,000 uh, truck drivers that are lucky enough to sit in a new truck during the next year, uh, our custom could also sh uh, give the um, dialogue a voice support to every truck driver they have. So that means around uh, 1 million drivers and 1 million customers that could have this added services and also expand their brand awareness and customer service and create an option for a huge added revenue stream. And finally, our customer was no longer locked to their current voice platform provider. So they can now actually own all the dialogue services that they've created and then be able to bring them into a platform out of choice outside of the original platform. So if they want to move to a different platform or wanted to expand in more than one platform. So please, uh, final, final slide, which is my thank you note. So thanks all for listening. And if you have an interest in the field of conversational, conversational AI, feel free to reach out. Thank you so much, Andreas. So uh, I couldn't find any questions right now, but one for from me. We'll not do the same again. Uh, but mm -hmm. if, if you could dream and go out of the box a bit uh, to see where your technology could be used for the nearest future to go a bit wild and crazy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if it's out of the box or not, but uh, a dream that hopefully is coming true soon is to actually help the people with bigger needs in the world. And we're today talking to um, a new startup scale up for within the Grundfos uh, environment, which is called WeWater. And they work with enabling fresh, fresh water to um, people who don't have access to fresh water and being able to use a dialogue solution to um, help in those, those deliveries, both from the people that want to get the water and for the people delivering the water, that would be a very exciting and fun project. So right now they're looking into pilot in Ghana. Interesting, exciting. Uh, and I have one more question from the Q&A. Uh, so could you just briefly mention some more user cases in the same topic? Uh, absolutely, I could go very wide. And of course, being from Gothenburg, the automotive industry is uh, very clearly. And also since when you're in a car, you also need focus on the road while driving. But we have done projects with, for example, Bonnier News, which is in a completely different field where we looked into the future of uh, news consumption from a very explorational level. So what would happen if you had a journalist sitting at your breakfast table and what type of dialogues would you hold with that journalist, for example? Mm -hmm. Interesting. So uh, maybe we can keep on that discussion uh, throughout the chat and uh, reach out for you, Andreas, uh, for more questions. Thank you so much, a big hand for you. And let's move on with our next startup. So are you, you well, ready, Anders? Uh, yes, I'm here. The stage is yours. Uh, OK, uh, first slide. So um, I'm Anders Harabring, CEO and co-founder at Imagimob. At Imagimob, and I'm going to talk about the project we did with gesture control headphones at CS, and we where we implemented deep learning on on small chips. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so Imagimob, we are experts in AI, and with that we mean doing artificial uh, applications on small chips, uh, and we help companies develop intelligent products. It can be making brand new products or improve old products. <clears throat> and what we have developed, Imagimob AI, <clears throat> uh, 
And that's a piece of software that covers the whole process from data collection to the finished edge application. And we offer this uh, to our customer as a software tools as a service. Uh, and together with that, we supply expertise, support, project management. <clears throat> and the main, the main benefit for our customers is uh, reduced cost, reduced development time and, and need for resources. And it also allows for democratization of development, which means that a normal en engineer can work on the system and create powerful edge AI applications. Next slide, please. So the project was about to do gesture control headphones um, with four robust and accurate gestures. We were using radar from Aconeer and edge AI from us. And the target platform had a constrained resources. It was an ARM Cortex M4 with 256 kilobytes of RAM. <clears throat> and the target was to demo this at CES in Las Vegas. Um, and we did that very successfully. We had 40 meetings in four days with, with BMW, with Sonos, uh, Sony, and many other companies. Next slide. So how did we solve this? First of all, we worked very closely together with Aconeer because they are the experts in radar. And then we used Imagimo AI for the whole process. So first we did data collection with seven people and then data collection and labeling. And then we did automatic generation of the AI model in our GPU cluster. Uh, after that, we verified the model to find the perfect AI model. And the final step was to take the AI model and co to, to convert it to C code for the application. And, and we can do that in the product by just the press of a button. Uh, uh, next slide. So what was the result? Well, we created a fast, robust and accurate application with four different gestures. Um, and the technology we used was deep learning. So it was a complex model with 15 different layers, CNNs, LSTMs, and other networks. And uh, the application only took 80K. And I think this was a great achievement because uh, the, the application was complex and radar data is, is high frequency. It's very complex data and a lot of data. So I think this was, this was a great achievement. Uh, next slide. Um, so why, why did we choose AI for this solution? I think it's like I said, radar data is high frequency, it's very complex and it's a lot of data. So um, for us, I mean, AI was the only way to do it. It was impossible to do it any other way. Next slide. So to summarize, what we offer to corporate customers is Imagine of AI that we offer like a, for an edge AI software tools as a service. And we can supply it together with that services. And that will help you reduce costs. It will give you control over the development uh, and reduce development time. And if you want to learn more, we have a white paper on our website uh, that you can download and, and learn more about this project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anders. And uh, I couldn't find any questions here from now on. Uh, do you have any call to action to the attendees out there? What do you wish for connections or anything else you, you want to have uh, in your email tomorrow morning? I think we're looking for customers from all segments, but, but very much from the industry. Uh, we're looking for customers that want uh, not only buy something from an external company, but to take a little bit of control, reducing its cost, uh, having its own people involved. Um, that, that's the type of companies we're looking for. Perfect. Thank you so much, Anders. Thank you for your presentation and uh, good luck with everything. And let's move on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Peter, are you ready? I am next up nice on this uh, virtual stage. Yeah. Um, so uh, 
guys, this is uh, what we want to give you uh, is also a little sneak peek into what we are doing at AI Innovation of Sweden. I don't know how many of you know about AI Innovation of Sweden, but AI Innovation of Sweden is the governmental initiative to accelerate AI within Swedish research, Swedish public sector, and Swedish business. Next slide, please. Um, and the vision, and most of all, the, the mission we do have is that we want to ignite the Swedish AI ecosystem, just like Ignite Sweden want to ignite the, the Swedish uh, startup scene. Uh, so for us, it's all about providing resources and, and making matchmaking happen between AI resources and AI owners and potential partners. And that's why startups uh, are so natural for us to work with. Next slide, please. Uh, we have a bunch of partners and we are truly a national initiative. Uh, we are, uh, as of from uh, a couple of months ago, uh, opened up a node even in Stockholm. Uh, our main node is based here in Gothenburg, uh, but we will also in the near future open up uh, nodes in uh, the north and the south. So we are uh, all over Sweden and we have an organization that are ready to help potential startups and investors find each other uh, all over. Next slide, please. Uh, but to do so, uh, we need a structure. And you've seen some of our partners today, both Econo and Tokematic uh, are partners at AI Innovation in Sweden. Uh, but what we are doing now and what you're about to see here is a sneak peek of the AISE startup program. And that is an initiative to, to help startups, but also corporates, also uh, large and medium-sized organizations all over Sweden to accelerate appli the application of AI. Uh, so the program focus, uh, uh, focuses on helping relevant Swedish startups with knowledge and with resources within AI uh, to find both customers, but also potential investors. Next slide, please. Um, and the program uh, uh, will be launched in uh, a month. Uh, it constitutes or consists of three stages or three steps uh, where everyone is welcome to take part. Every startup uh, relevant for the program is uh, welcome to take part of the first stage where it's all about education. It's about educating uh, within AI, within the field of machine learning and deep learning and how you can use it. Uh, we have open events and workshops uh, all over Sweden. And then uh, we have a uh, filter process or evaluation process of how ready you are uh, to, to scale uh, your AI solution or your solution towards real customers. So uh, then you go into stage two and that's all about on our aim there is to connect you to the right partners. Um, a lot of the Swedish AI startups focus on, on uh, one of our main partners, which is Volvo, both Volvo Cars and, and Volvo Group. But we know uh, and we have discussions and dialogues with a lot of other uh, companies where we will be able to find you partners, we will be able to find you projects, and we will be able to find you also interested investors. Uh, and then in the next stage uh, where we have the next filter, uh, we want to have you as a potential partner. Uh, we, wanna, uh, we want you to be able to join us just as uh, Tokematic has done, just like Econo has done, uh, so that we can connect you to investors, but we can, that we also can uh, get you access to our data factory and our data sets so that you will be a full partner of AI Innovation of Sweden. Next slide, please. Um, so the process uh, or the program will open up in uh, three weeks. Uh, we will launch it together with our new sites and you will find more information at ai.se uh, where you also will be able to uh, apply uh, for uh, to be a part of the program. And I really hope you do so because uh, as a startup founder myself uh, and as uh, really uh, engaged in the, the AI network all over Sweden. I, I see that we can uh, provide tremendous, uh, a lot of value together with uh, companies like uh, or organizations like uh, Ignite Sweden and through our close connection to, to Vinova. Uh, so just to finish up with the last slide, uh, we have partners uh, and we what we wanna do is 
to ignite the Swedish AI system. And you as a startup and you as an investor are really important in that role. So uh, now I'm open for questions. And if you want more information, you can just visit AI.se. Thank you so much, Peter. And I was happy to hear that you are going up north as well. I did miss out some universities up north. Uh, thank you for that nice presentation. Uh, so uh, let's see for the Q&A. Uh, is there any case that the AI innovation with Sweden support to foreign startups in Sweden? For example, can a Korean AI startup in Stockholm ask some support? Uh, yes, uh, we will be uh, an enabler for the, the Swedish AI ecosystem. Uh, we uh, can help them and guide them uh, to uh, through the uh, Swedish AI ecosystem and to find them the right partner when it comes to uh, maybe looking into the uh, academic or research side. And we can always ask our partners if they have an interest in their technology. Uh, and one more question is, um, well, there is an ecosystem with other organizations doing uh, some sort of the work that you are doing. Yeah. How do you plan to work with all the other organizations in the ecosystem? Uh, Oh yeah, so so our focus is that we are a partner organization. So we work uh, together with, as Magnus uh, said that in the thread, we work together already with a lot of those organizations. We work together with rights. We work together with the universities, uh, and uh, we're going to work together with Ignite uh, to be able to to do this. Uh, we have a lot of partners where we can match make them. Uh, match make them to the right partner at the startup but what we focus on is especially the ai part we are not uh, and this is important we are not a startup accelerator uh, we are there to help them uh, with their their uh, field of art with the field of artificial intelligence we are there to evaluate where they stand on their technology uh, and if they are relevant we can help them uh, get in contact and, and get started with our partners and uh, uh, so that's our role I see. And I, I really like that uh, AI readiness to scale. Uh, so what do you think about the Swedish startups? Are they ready to scale or not? Uh, a lot of them are. Uh, as we had the panel discussion or as we talked about earlier in the, the investors panel, um, one of the challenges we do have in the, the startup space uh, working with AI is that um, nationally we do uh, lot of projects uh, we get stuck in, in basically a project mood mode uh, where we do projects on projects on projects and projects and, and kind of project studies or, or research studies uh, so one of the things and why we exist uh, is uh, also to get the corporates uh, really going and, and trying to solve real problems not only doing projects uh, so i would say that we this is is two-folded uh, we do have a lot of great startups uh, all over Sweden, and we do have a lot of ones ready to scale, but we also need to work uh, like Ignite are doing, but we also need to work with the, the corporates to get them ready uh, and up and running, ready to, to buy services from startups and buy products. And I think that fit works, that fit perfectly into all the incubators and the, the other ecosystems exactly. that uh, we exactly. need to find that real problems too. Exactly. And, and, and I can't stress that enough that uh, we are not here to compete with anyone. We are here to, to complement them uh, with contacts, uh, with the AI knowledge we have in our network. So, so we want to work with as many as possible when it comes to the startups. Exciting. Thank you so much, Peter. Do you Can want to add something? Your... Yes, of course. Yes. Sorry. I'm <laughs> very rude here. Yeah, I think you know, another thing that uh, that the Innovation of Sweden will will be able to cater for is also to educate startups that are interested in strengthening their AI um, yes. offering or even getting started uh, with AI and connect yes. also those kind of startups to how do you say resources and, and projects where they actually can develop the first uh, part of it. And I think that that's a huge gap today uh, for, for a lot of these really early startups to actually get access to that knowledge and the data sets and everything that, that you can actually be the bridge to, to do. So I, I am really looking forward to this collaboration. And another thing that, that is going on, it's like more of a, uh, 
we're looking at a European perspective, uh, there's a lot of countries at the moment. Uh, I know that you, the Horizon, uh, New Horizon program will, uh, will focus a lot on AI startups. And there's a huge initiative now to actually do a proper EU mapping of all EU startups that Peter will be heavily involved with and also Ignite. So uh, I think in a couple of weeks, you will probably be able to hear more about this, but it's really important also to connect us in a European perspective and of course, global perspective. Yes. Right? Definitely. Uh, and we are looking forward to, to and that's why we do it. We really want to accelerate the deified AI scene in Sweden. Uh, and uh, that we, to do that, we have to do it together. So, so uh, I'm so looking forward to that progress as well. Yeah. And I'm also thinking in retrospect of, of the, the patent uh, vision we got yes. <laughs> earlier on, we can really address this importance. Yeah. Doing more. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Great. Thank you so much, Peter. So and thank you. So we are about to sum everything up. Do you, if if you could share any key takeaways from this afternoon, do you have anything you want to share? Um, well, I know uh, I've met a lot of the startups um, from from all over Sweden, especially here in the west of Sweden, but but also in Stockholm and in Malmo. And I've heard a lot about uh, the north uh, startups. And and what we should be proud of is that we have startups solving real problems and uh, they are doing the work for real uh, and now it's up to us to help them accelerate that to help them apply their solutions uh, to more cases so that they can really get going uh, and and even though we have the, the situation we're in right now I, we also know that there's a lot of investors uh, ready to to look into the cases and invest in the cases so so i'm looking forward in in helping out and i'm looking forward to seeing the, the the startup scene the ai startup scene flourish in the coming coming year thank you so much peter and thank you for being a part of this conference this afternoon. thank you so much thank you so Stina, we are about to wrap things up. What is your feeling right now? Well, I'm super happy that it actually <laughs> that we actually made it, and I'm super happy of all the attendees. Uh, we have, I think we counted up to 200 in total, uh, including uh, the Zoom and uh, the stream online. Uh, we will now close the, the stream online session. But before that, I just want to go next slide, please, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to give a heads up that, uh, that we are not uh, closing down in any way, uh, quite the opposite. We are, <laughs> we've been working harder the, the last weeks than, than we usually do, actually. Um, and I think this is a very good sign. We get in touch with a lot of new corporates all the time, and they are still very interested in meeting startups. And, and I think this is something that we all should be very happy and, and grateful about. But it also means that there are a lot of new, more um, opportunities to, to interact during the spring. And now today we are testing this very special format uh, for Ignite. So tomorrow we hope that uh, a lot of you corporates listening in and a lot of you investors uh, will uh, book meetings now with the startups that you've heard. And I think you have instructions in your email on how to do it in our platform. Ignite Magic. Um, otherwise, we will be happy to assist you with that, of course. Uh, normally, uh, when we work with, with a corporate uh, or an investor, we could open for that as well uh, during this phase or this time, is that we want to sit down with you to understand what you're looking for and your, your biggest challenges at the moment where you can find uh, great projects for a startup within your organization. Uh, so book a call with us, with some from the Ignite team. And then, if you want, attend one or more of our matchmakings. And they are open to all startups all over Sweden. At the moment, we actually have 1,100 startups in our databases. So uh, we can really find the startups that you have the right challenges for. So I really want to encourage you to do more meet more startups, uh, give us your challenges, and, and we will pair you to the perfect match. And there's also a lot of funding opportunities going on now uh, in Sweden with the help of uh, our government, for example. And we will also be very happy to try to guide you to boost this project and really get going because it's important, it's crucial for the startups to have projects going now. 
we, we can also see a pattern that a lot of projects are, of course, slowing down now, but this is really important to keep the pace. And maybe we can find some new that are even more needed right now. Exactly. Maybe we can help you to access some funding. Yes. So stay with us during the spring, but also stay here. I know that uh, our colleague backstage pro Michelle is right now uh, turning in this turning this uh, Zoom conference into a huge uh, opportunity to to mingle and network. Uh, so you will soon be moved from attendee to panelist, which will allow you to chat with, uh, in practice, anyone in the room. And we will have this open now for, for another hour. So please use this opportunity to find each other and, uh, and to talk and maybe connect on LinkedIn after and that. I, I think this is all about sharing. As you might see, we are passionate about helping to connect startup with corporates and uh, other organizations. So uh, feel free to reach out to us in any way on LinkedIn or anywhere uh, and uh, we will see what we can do to help um, but share as well i mean this was uh, some really nice presentation if you know anyone who are interested in this startup uh, share the link from youtube so they can watch it uh, later on there are so many ways of just spreading the words so now we want to say thank you to all youtube uh, viewers thank you for for being with us today and uh, we hope that we will be back with another conference like this quite soon. Thank you so much.